Ó, I don't. No, he knows. No, he's got enough people. He doesn't. He doesn't have a combo if he just wants to avoid me. Pure and simple. He doesn't do himself, but he's going to do it. Just um, pure Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Weathersfield Planning and Zoning Commission meeting of January 7th. Would the uh, clerk help me with the roll call, please? Absolutely. Uh, Chairman Harley. Hey, I'm here. Vice Chairman Roberts. Here. I'm here. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Oikel. Here. Mr. Hammer. Here. Mr. Homiki. Here. Mr. Dean. Here. Mr. Silva. Here. Mr. Edwards. Ms. Antoniak, Ms. Murphy. Good. All right. So if my math is correct, we have nine participants, and everybody can uh, can play in the sandbox tonight. So would you like to move into the first item? Absolutely. Item 3.1, application 203019-Z, seeking a special permit in accordance with section 5.2 to construct approximately 5,000 square foot building with showroom, outdoor display, and various sites improvements at 1912 Berlin Turnpike. Welcome. So if you would introduce yourself and uh, describe what's going on. I, we all know you've been here a couple times. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Ozzy Torres. I'm the professional engineer who uh, is working for our client, uh, Mr. Uh, Tamponi and uh, his sister, uh, Natalia Pedra, who are uh, here seeking for an approval for the site plan uh, at uh, 1912 Berlin Turnpike. Um, if I may just quickly uh, explain to you what the site looks like presently, and then we'll go on to the proposal and uh, all of the comments uh, up to date. Basically, it's a 0.62 acre site located on the east side of the Berlin Turnpike uh, on north, northbound traffic entering it in a couple of areas. Pre presently there are two uh, driveway curb cuts on the highway. The, the land slopes to the east to where there is a wetlands and a floodplain zone. Uh, also it is wooded pretty much uh, three quarters of the parcel. Uh, with brush and then around the edges of the property we have some um, trees trees lining around the outside edges. The, uh, the parcel has existing utilities coming to it. Uh, there's a sanitary sewer, there's a walk, uh, the sanitary sewer. Water is uh, uh, existing to the north and we'll, as we will demonstrate, we'll, we'll extend it to the parcel. Um, there is no gas, there is electricity uh, to the parcel, and uh, we have, uh, as I said, sewage. The storm system presently in the highway drains north uh, in the Berlin Turnpike, 
with an outlet pipe uh, shown on this property. Uh, recently, we've discovered that pipe isn't there, so I'll, I'll make that comment uh, about other comments that were made, whether that pipe will get in our way in the proposal. Now, as was mentioned by the chairman, uh, we are proposing uh, to install a, a building that's 50 by 100 feet, 50 feet wide, 105 feet long, pretty much, um, with entry. Originally, we had followed the existing entries, but we've, we've heard comments from the State Highway Department and asked us to make it only one uh, ingress and egress on the north end so the traffic coming in has a little more time to be able to slow down and get into the parcel. So we had presented this before as two driveways, uh, but now we're trying to follow uh, the direction of the DOT. Uh, at the time when we submitted these plans, we were not um, sure, we did not get a, c a complete letter yet from DOT, but we did have informal information that they were looking for this driveway. So that's when we prepared a plan to show you of what we were looking for. Uh, subsequently, while we were waiting to come to the next meeting, um, which was uh, canceled because of bad weather, we, we got the complete letter from DOT and now we have some more information to be able to deal with and, we're, and we'll go through that. Um, so we will be able to enter in and th serve the parcel with parking spaces in the front and parking along the south borderline of the property. There's also a display area for uh, some of the products used in the store, stone work in the, in the process of, of the manufacturing little company. <coughs> and um, we will have display areas in on the south side of the building and also on the other side of this drive. Um, Originally, there was a well on the parcel, and now we are going to extend some water to come in to serve the parcel with water. Um, now, the lighting will be uh, taken care of off the building. If I can go on to the next few pages. I guess our next page is the utility page, so we'll talk about that. What we plan to do is to create a high point on the uh, entryway and exitway and drain all the water back in the same direction that it's going now, and the storm system has been designed to do that. We have uh, prepared an underground detention system so that we do not have any increase in runoff. We've submitted uh, drainage calculations to the commission, I mean to the uh, town engineer and um, that was all approved as we went for wetlands application uh, seeing that, that we were discharging stormwater into the wetland and we have approval from wetlands and it's been submitted uh, to the commission uh, we were able to comply with all the requirements for that drainage requirements uh, also we have a water quality unit installed so that uh, the water coming off the parking lot will be clean through that, and any clean roof water goes directly into the detention system before it is discharged out into the wetland. As I said before, we have been able to comply with all the requirements and all the comments that were made for wetlands, um, and any further comments, we'll try and make a quick answer at this meeting. Uh, the grading plan and erosion control plan are shown on, on this sheet C3. Uh, basically, as I had stated, there'll be a little high point in the entrance and exit way, and the rest of the area will drain towards our storm system and discharge out to the wetland. So that's how it's presently graded with all the roof drainage collecting into that system we showed you a moment ago. And um, the grading as shown uh, is working along with that storm system in the same direction. Here we have the erosion control plan, which again was approved through wetlands and uh, reviewed, and we completely complied with all their regulations. 
one of the latest comments has been to uh, note that this is a double row of hay bales around the perimeter of the property to protect the wetlands and uh, we have complied with that note that was asked for. Uh, with this new entryway, we tried to show that uh, the vehicle that's required, which is an SU-30 vehicle, would be able to make all the turns to come into the parcel, back up to deliver uh, material for the process, and then also to come in and back up into the dumpster area, which we relocated. If you recall, we originally had the dumpster area in this corner, and um, the commission had asked us if we could find a better place for it, and we did. We, we relocated to the north side of the building. Um, if you look at the first plan, we also have screening along that side so that that's well screened. Um, and uh, all of that, again, that existing pavement, that proposed pavement will drain out and come back to the filtering system and into the uh, wetlands. So no trucks on the south side then now? That's correct. There will be no one entering from the south side. All Either trucks all trucks or cars will be going. The north side. Yes. Okay. Um, on the south side. On this north side, they'll be wide enough. Uh, presently, we were showing it around 27 feet. The trucks can turn around, all right. Yes, that's what this plan here shows. And um, okay. as uh, one of the additional comments by DOT was that we use an SU-30, so we have revised that. And also, they had made some other comment about adding well, a small you, island. Won't you be getting bigger vehicles in? Yeah. No, 50s? Or no. They, they don't need anything larger than a, a, a box oh. or 30, an SU-30, wheelbase 30. That's the most they're going to get. And it's basically the, the garbage truck because their delivery truck of their product is not that long. It's much shorter. Finally, of course, the uh, original details. We have all the erosion control details, concrete pad details, the outlet structure details. Uh, we also have a guardrail detail in the rear, and a comment was made on one of the uh, reviews by the Rocky Hill Engineering Department temporarily while uh, your town engineer was not available. And um, we've answered, we we're willing to <laughs> revise that detail in whichever way the engineering department require, w would like us to do it. <coughs> this page here is primarily uh, the uh, MDC water connection details. Um, as you saw in the utility sheet, we're going to bring a, a water line down to extend the existing water line because the parcel had a well on it, but it's been abandoned. So we talked to the health department. They would rather see us extend the water line rather than trying to go back for a well permit. Uh, and uh, the process in uh, what in their stone cutting process, they use a little bit of water. It's not a lot. So um, we're going to extend the water line. We've, we've met with MDC. Uh, we have to go through their approval review uh, but mo all of the work being done for that extension is within the state highway, so it will be all part of our review through the st from the state as well as MDC because we'll, we're going to have to use any cross-sections of the pavement th th that's being replaced. We'll have to match whatever uh, DOT tells us to have. When coming down the, uh, it's that third lane that's trapped in there. Let me show you where it is. You see here is the utility plan. The state highway is back here about 50 feet from the curb. And so the water line is actually very close to the edge of the highway, probably about 8 to 10 feet. So we're going to extend it in that same location, come down to the corner of the property, and then serve the building with the water service. And how far up, how long is it there? The length of that line yeah. is about 200 feet. It's, um, so you won't be disrupting traffic on the highway? No, we're not on the we're highway. On the we're, in, we're in the edge, but we're still required to follow DOT standards, and, um, and we will do so, and as well as the MDC standards, which we'll have to follow as well. But um, again, this, this approval uh, will be through those two agencies, so 
uh, if this commission would just let us uh, get approval for this site and uh, the condition that we get through approvals on them, that's what we're, we're looking for. As you know, DOT will not approve the plan until they've re we've received approval from the town, so it's kind of a catch-22. So, you know, one of you has to bend a little, so that's how it's going to be. Um, finally, there were further comments uh, by uh, Planning and Zoning, which we have com pretty much covered on every item on here. Um, by uh, Peter himself, we you know revised the zoning t block. We did that. Uh, possible to reduce the number of parking spaces. We've reduced them, um, and we've gone through the uh, required trees. We've um, we've counted it through, and we provided a note on the plan that says that uh, we're asking for a waiver for that, because as we had stated, the perimeter of the property is entirely covered with woods, and it's almost like, why, why add another tree at, when we got so many already around us? And uh, we're screening from no one but a wetlands, a big, large wetlands. So that waiver is requested in there. Um, let's see, uh, the circulation of traffic. Now it's going to be, as we talked about it, we, it's going to be enter, park, and go out, and uh, also pick up the, the trash back and then go out. So that's all shown, and um, we already have arrows and so on shown. But uh, but uh, DOT is going to require us to do whatever because most of this space here is right in front of the – it's in their property, and um, they have uh, sign standards that they're asking us to put in there. So we're going to be putting all that on the plan. Um, we have to include a standard state – uh, sheets to the back of the whole set for them. So by the time you get a mile hour, it'll be about 15 sheets long. <laughs> Unfortunately, we'll have to get that, but that's how it's going to be. Um, as I said, it will be through their review and approval. One, one question. Go ahead. George. Uh, George. Uh, that uh, pipe that the DOT yes. eliminated. Oh, I can. How did they want you to deal with it? Just right. forget about it? Plug no. it up? No, as a matter of fact, um, they do want us to do that. What do they they mentioned in the letter, and, and I think they have it. I um, may have read it, I forget. Just let me, uh, that's great now. <coughs> they can verbalize it. So well, yeah, I just wanted to get to the page here. Oh. Right, here's the pipe. The surveyor had, had a uh, looked in the basin and seen that there's a pipe stub up going out, but didn't get inside of it. Of course, the highway, they were going 60 miles an hour, so 45 at least. So uh, he assumed it goes this way, but actually DOT did send us a copy of one of their plans, the state plans, that shows that it is actually only halfway <laughs> within the right-of-way, and then there's a, a wall, an existing um, head, wall. head wall. And there used to be a ditch from there out to the, not a pipe. So there's no pipe there. No pipe there. The pipe the ends here, yeah. and they would like us to remove it and uh, block up the hole in the back of the basin. So that's what we put on the plan, okay. on our revised plan, and that's what you will see eventually through the DOT approval process. That's what they were asking for. Um, I think that pretty much covers everything. We we tried to uh, answer all the comments, again, from the staff and as well as the Rocky Hill uh, Review uh, Engineering Department. We did submit new calculations for the drainage, but as you see, we're going to have less pavement now, so what we've designed will handle what the, the amount of pavement that we have, and that's all in that drainage calculation that we submitted. Um, it, it changed the runoff coefficient favorably so that uh, we have no problem. We don't even have, we don't have to redesign the whole thing just to lose, you know. We have plenty of, of storage space for what is there and is proposed. Okay? All right. I so, think that so the way you presented it, <coughs> you were responding to the December 13th, the most recent set of comments correct. from Peter. That's right. Mean? December 13th comments from Peter. And if, I mean, we, 
we put everything on the plan i think if if we've missed anything we'll make sure we cover it through the staff you know final check but it's pretty much there okay and on december sixth you guys will see it in your package december sixth is when the dot gave them the the comments and Correct. just so the public understands we've seen this a number of times actually at this point the most recent though we wanted to know that dot was okay with what was proposed because we had some concerns that they might not and in fact they did have some problems so you have now redesigned the access point in summary that's what you've done Redes redesigned the access point so you know condot will give you their approval after they're done that's really what it boils down to uh, i could quickly <coughs> I did, we did do a, a quick design of, and you can see there's that little island that I was telling you about. Yep. And so this design right here will follow what DOT wants. And that's the only difference to the plan. Okay. It's really the main difference. They want us out here in the, uh, the uh, island of the highway, they want us to put a one-way sign heading north so that when you're coming out of the site, you don't turn left. You know, you're, you very clearly <coughs> see that big one-way going that way. So that's one of the requirements, as well of uh, stop sign, stop bar, the usual, and um, arrows. So we're, we're complying pretty much with their comments, and as well as uh, Peter's comments about the circulation of the traffic in and out of it. All right. Uh, so there are three specific waivers that you're asking for. The number of parking spaces. Correct. Can you be specific and tell us how many were required and how many do you have? Okay. For the record. We went in that chart. Um, parking, parking, parking. Is it? Okay, parking. Work area required four spaces. Showroom area requires five spaces. And total required 14 spaces. And total provided are 10 spaces okay. with one van space. So we did reduce it as you were requesting. From, from 14 down to 10. That's right. Okay, thank you. And uh, the is number that, per. Is that going to be enough? Yeah, yeah we I'm sorry. It, it is enough because um, they have maybe one or two people come into their uh, showroom at a time. It really, they don't have a big crowd come in. Most of the uh, parking is going to be between the employees and, um, and that's about it. And how many employees? <coughs> how many employees? Ten employees or not. Ten employees? But, but they're all the... Okay. We don't have to pay the driver to stay with the car at this point. All right. Or give him the brother because he'll come on to the other side. Mm hmm. So on your site plan, you have um, this additional area that could be converted to parking, but you're using it for an outdoor display, display That's area. That's absolutely correct. Okay. Yep. So if, if there is a parking problem, uh, that that uh, area could become okay. uh, a parking. Cause because I think you had more parking in the original layout. We did, we did, but we changed that to uh, space because you mentioned you wanted to reduce. And we also extended those spaces. We added the five foot grass strip, which you had required. And then we added 18 feet parking <coughs> so that all of that area, including that display area, could be used for future parking, if it needs it. But I've been to their establishment in uh, Meriden and there's always no one there, <laughs> almost no one. So, so I, I can envision that it is a low volume you know, yes, it place. Is. And so yes, it is. As Most long as there's the opportunity, I personally don't much care if there's less blacktop on day one. Well, there you go. Right? Well, it's um, going to be blacktop. It's just not going to be striped. Not striped, true point. enough. That's the display area, right? The third item was, re, uh, was parking in the front yard. So could you right, clarify we, what we exactly? We really can't uh, help that. Uh, we, we need those few spaces and there's not much, uh, since the highway takes up most of that whole front area. It's not in the DOT property, right? That's it's not, not even in the DOT. I mean, they could, if, if it ever got to some other business or someone else taking the parcel, they could lease land from the state right. as everyone else is doing pretty much up, up and down the highway. Okay. All right. Other questions for the applicant? One question I have is the <coughs> Location of the uh, the show areas for stone. Is I'm just having a hard time because when we're driving down the turnpike, is that visible from the turnpike? Is the well, it's not really. Yes, it is in a way, but it's not really meant to be visible. That because most of the time it's people who are calling 
that, that you know, they're customers that you know. It's not just a drive-by view of this stone. It's because you're looking for that kind of product, and then they need a place to go outside and look at it because it's such a big storage area. Well, I, I've been going by some of these facilities in other areas, and and the, the stone areas, you know, the stone is, is raw stone, so that it's, it's, it's not pretty looking, you know, as, as you're driving by. And I'm just looking at... Uh, uh, what we're looking at uh, as the public as we're driving down the, the Burlington Turnpike. Most of this, we're showing it not to go beyond the building where uh, where you have your establishment now. It's actually in the front of the building. But here, it'll be no further than the, the face of the building. It's in the back Maybe portion. The other side of the building. Right. And this area here is heavily wooded by that time. Right. So you're not going to see it. The, the building blocks it from traffic going south, and as you're coming north, you're not going to see it unless you're looking for the part okay. for that product. You're going to be worried about merging with that lane. Well, it's going to be looking over there. It, you know, <laughs> DOT understands that, and we tried to make as much uh, of an entry as we could, and they did not ask us to actually cut in and give it a, a, a turning lane, but I don't think there's enough time. So. Make sure you do. It's, it's going to be something like, well, they've got to do something about it. Yep. And that's how we're going to treat it, I assume. So, uh, by the way, I was reminded that we all need to talk into our mics. Apparently, we've had problems hearing the recordings in the past. So if you could do that. And Joe? <coughs> Thanks, Tom. A few questions on operations. What would the hours of operations be, both in terms of the manufacturing and the retail showroom? Okay. That's it. Five, how many days a week? Uh, the, the presentation is Monday through Friday. And then the showrooms open uh, Saturday from 9 o'clock to 2 o'clock the next day. And, and what is it exactly that you're making there? You know, what, what type of operations in terms of the manufacturing take place? Could, could, stuff, could, you do me, uh, yes. uh, could you do me a favor and come up to the microphone until we have a good recording of this? Thank yes. you. I was going to ask him to give his name. <laughs> give him your name. And yeah, my name is Tiago Temponi. My sister knows better than me. She was, but she's sick today. She couldn't come in. It's most of countertops, you know. We cut with the water, no dust, no nothing major. You know, it's something you put in your kitchen to cook. And everything's nice and clean, you know. And the operation hours, like I said, it's from nine to five. Saturday we open to nine to two, just a showroom, and basically that's it. Where are you <laughs> operating right now? Yes, in Berlin. Berlin, and yeah. um, how much? How often do you get you know deliveries coming in with material, and how often do you have trucks going out? Twice a week. For and deliveries. Yeah, and maybe the dumpster. Maybe it's up every three weeks. And that's that's about it. the trucks is very small trucks not like a, a triaxle it's a small trucks that come and drop them one slab because they can't carry no more than five I think you know so five small sl trucks five yeah. slabs of stone at yes a yes okay and then in terms of deliveries that go out do you just deliver one kitchen at a time y yes one, one, I mean slabs they drop like two slabs at a time. The kitchen, the kitchen. When we made it, we loaded in the morning the truck, and that's it. We out. We come back at five o'clock and done. And how many of those go out on a typical day? Of the two, two cargo vans. Okay. You no, know, they go out at like nine in the morning, come back at five. They not, they don't stay there. You know, they go out and come back. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for the applicant? Is, is there anybody in the public that wishes to speak on this? It is a public hearing. I guess I should have described the process. So the commission talks to the applicant and gets information out of the applicant, and then we ask to the public for their comment. And the way the process will work is if, um, if we feel that we have enough information from the applicant, we will move to close the hearing. If we don't, we would continue the hearing to another meeting and let them produce more uh, documentation the next time around. Um, so this is your opportunity to speak. Is there anybody in the public who wishes to comment?
Last comments from the commissioner? No? Uh, Mr. Chairman, one yes, last thing. Sure. I forgot to mention that we did go to the uh, review, design. the design review advisory design. commission. Yep. And, and uh, they made their comments and we complied with them all. And uh, all the members have a copy of the revised uh, building plan with the right colors and the right materials, uh, just as the commission had asked them. Okay. Just to put that in the record, sir. Thank you. Would uh, anybody like to make a motion for us? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, very good. Someone would like to uh, oppose a motion for discussion? Make a motion to oppose. Oh. Make a motion to oppose. Want to speak into the mic? You want to talk into the mic? Sorry. Since Jeff can't hear me. Yeah, I know he can't. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Make a motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. All right. <coughs> any, any conditions? I'm not sure. There are a couple of suggested conditions from the fire marshal. There are a couple of uh, outstanding issues with the uh, town engineer. Uh, just so you, you might have seen correspondence from the Rocky Hill town of engineer. Our engineer was uh, uh, out of work for a little bit of time, so we utilized uh, the services of the Rocky Hill uh, Engineering Department, so that's why you saw those comments. Um, there are a few revisions necessary for the DOT, and then there were one or two um, revisions that I, that I needed. Uh, the motion should also reflect the three waivers. Uh, so if you wanna include the waivers uh, as part of your motion, and then if you just want to simply say that the final revised plans will be reviewed and approved by the town engineer, fire marshal, uh, and the uh, planning department, uh, that would suffice as the DOT will be doing their own uh, sign off. We don't need to necessarily condition it on their approval. So if, if you uh, were willing to include those <coughs> stipulations, I think that would cover it. Thank you, Peter. I'll, I'll accept all of those. No second. All right. Just my just one one question. Um, it was pointed out that if they needed the extra four parking spaces, they have paved area where they could do it. Do we think we should put a note there that says something like, you know, possible for additional parking spaces if needed or something like that? On the site uh, plan? Yeah, the site that, plan or yeah. somewhere in the approval. Maybe on the site plan. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense because if, yeah, if yeah. for whatever reason they either decide not to have an outdoor display or this building is used by some other kind of right. retail use that doesn't have large outdoor displays, you'd want the parking. So we're comfortable letting Peter put together the final wording on those conditions? You two gentlemen? Are, yeah. Okay. All right. So we have the uh, topics that Peter raised and then the topic that Joe raised. Anything else? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes. Good Thank luck. You. Get going. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A long time coming. <laughs> say hello to your sister for us. that Dan Silver is uh, leaving us for the second topic. The record can show that. Would you like to uh, open? Just moving on to item 3.2, uh, application 2028-19Z, Maple Street 24, LLC, seeking a special permit in accordance with 5.2F2 uh, to construct a 6,000 foot uh, square foot restaurant building and associated site improvements at 24 Maple Street. Thank you.
I commend you on knowing how to bring all that stuff down. Because <laughs> <laughs> she knew I couldn't do it. <laughs> all right, welcome back. Uh, I think Thank you know you. the routine. Please introduce Thank yourself. You. And, uh, Thank you very much. For the record, my name is Peter Alter. I'm a lawyer. I practice law in Glastonbury in the firm of Alter and Pearson. And we're here tonight to represent the applicant owner with respect to the development of uh, a restaurant on the corner of Maple Street Route 3 and Middletown Avenue, uh, requesting special permits for that approval. Mr. Chairman, for the record, uh, does a little housekeeping. I, I am submitting an affidavit with respect to the posting of the signs as required by your regulation. Uh, we had previously submitted to Mr. Gillespie uh, evidence of the mailing, uh, and I have uh, another copy of that plus all the certificates. Thank you. <coughs> Tonight, uh, in addition to uh, the information that I will provide, uh, with respect to this application uh, for the development of a full service restaurant uh, on the property at 24 Maple Street. You'll hear from Kevin Johnson at Close Jensen and Miller, um, Jim Buberis, our traffic engineer, uh, and also present and, and available for particular questions if there are any is Corey Guerra, our project engineer and uh, Edward Diamond, our project architect, as well as uh, Mr. Joseph Sulo, who is the manager and member of the owner and applicant for this operation, as well as his restaurant partner, Dorian Puka, who is, uh, some of you may be familiar with other restaurants uh, that he uh, is the moving force behind in West Hartford, Treva, Avert and Sohara are restaurants that uh, he has developed uh, in addition to uh, working uh, on the restaurant that is presented to you this evening. The um, slide now up is, is just to uh, remind the commission what uh, the process that we've gone through to date uh, that brings us to this public hearing and our application for special permits. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals did grant some relief with respect to uh, the redevelopment of the existing warehouse and office building uh, on the site. We made uh, several appearances before the Historic District Commission, first with respect to the demolition of uh, the two existing houses that were uh, located adjacent to the original site. We came to the Planning and Zoning Commission for a pre-application review and then for a zone change application which uh, occurred in December of 2018, January of 2019 when the change to the business park zone for the two smaller parcels was approved. We then appeared before the Historic District Commission uh, at several of their meetings as this property is within the Hor Historic District Commission jurisdictional area. Uh, it was within their province to review and ultimately approve the design of the building that is presented to you tonight. Uh, I will say that um, they're ex extremely thorough in their review of, of applications like this. They made several really good suggestions which Mr. Sulo embraced and had his uh, architect and engineers incorporate into the plan so that the plan you see before you tonight was unanimously approved by the Historic District Commission uh, at, at its final uh, review of, of this uh, application and a certificate of appropriateness has been issued. We appeared before Are you the- Are going to elaborate on what they said? Yes, no. Mr. Wise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we oh, have, okay. We have lots of information for you. I'm just. Skip over. No, no. I, I certainly wouldn't do that. Okay. We appeared before the Inland Wetlands and, and Conservation Commission. 
with respect to the application uh, for activity within the, the flood zone and with respect to erosion sedimentation control plan, both of which were approved unanimously uh, by, by that agency, uh, bringing us to tonight and our application for uh, these special permits. As some of you are aware, Mr. Sulo, uh, in one of his business enterprises, uh, operates the restaurant supply uh, company that is housed in the old New Britain candy warehouse. He has undertaken, uh, as I'm sure you've all seen, major renovations and upgrades and modernization to that building um, and has put it to use uh, for his business purposes uh, in a substantial commitment of his resources to uh, bring the property into a, a more appropriate character and appearance than it had had for, for many, many years. Uh, after the acquisition of the two uh, smaller parcels um, and the zone change, uh, the property now consists of 5.46 acres. The warehouse uh, occupies about 77,000 square feet. The offices within the, that building occupy about 3,700 square feet. Tonight we seek approvals uh, from this commission for special permits with respect to the restaurant with outside down it, dining. And related to that, uh, under your regulation, this we believe qualifies as a business redevelopment under your section 5.8, I'm sorry, 5.6 regulation. Uh, and so uh, we've included that as part of our application. Um, the language of 5.8 is particularly relevant to this particular site um, since it, it states that it would be proposing redevelopment and renovation of a site that does not comply with the strict application of the regulations. And we do not comply with the strict applications of the business park regulations. The pre-existing uh, building has uh, setbacks where in the business park zone 50 feet would be required by regulation. The existing building is 26 feet uh, from Maple Street. Uh, the side yard, which should be 25 feet in this zone, uh, adjacent to the railroad tracks area is 7.4 feet. And the rear setback, which is also a 25 foot setback, is actually only 13 feet. So we seem to fall into the provisions of section 5.6 and we included that as, as part of our application because of that. In addition, uh, 5.8B of your regulation, uh, which is, is directed at the sale of alcoholic beverages. This is really a full service restaurant with uh, alcoholic beverages served as part of uh, the hospitality to uh, guests that come to, uh, to enjoy themselves there. Um, and so we want it to be clear that we meet the requirements of uh, 5.8B as well. Specifically, um, and, and this slide is, is a good one to, to make you aware of, of distances, the nearest house, nearest residence from the restaurant building would be on, on the parcel numbered 17 on the aerial photograph. Uh, it's 377 feet more or less from the restaurant building to uh, that house, which is the nearest house. As you can see from the slide directly across from uh, the proposed restaurant is a part of the Great Meadow Preserve uh, open space. There, there is no residential use that will ever uh, occur there. The other nearest houses uh, along Middletown Avenue are about 477 feet uh, in distance from the restaurant. The distance to the nearest establishment that serves alcohol, and it took us a little while to figure out which one that is, it's actually City Fish. Um, serves beer and wine as part of its uh, food in, inside food service. That's approximately 600 feet distant from uh, our site. And then distance to the nearest school 
which is the parochial school um, adjacent to Silas Dean School, is 4,100 feet from our site, and the nearest church would be the, the Roman Catholic Church next to the school, and that would be 3,940 feet, more or less, from our site. We couldn't find any charitable organizations that are remotely associated with this. That's one of the other categories that's spelled out in uh, that section of the regulation. So we think that we satisfy the expectations of, of uh, the commission as spelled out in its regulations with respect to uh, that special <coughs> permit. Um, finally, uh, you're also guided by Article 8 of your regulations with respect to the guidelines and criteria for special permits. A lot of the information that, <coughs> excuse me, Kevin Johnson, Jim Buberis, and I will provide tonight is directed at demonstrating compliance with all of the provisions of Article 8 of the regulations as with respect to all special permits. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask Kevin Johnson to come up and walk you through the site uh, details and design. Uh, then Mr. Buberis will deliver uh, his traffic report and conclusions, and, uh, and then we'll talk about architecture. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Kevin Johnson, Close Jensen, and Miller. Um, yeah, I'm going to. Well, I'm going to skip over this slide for now. Um, basically, I want to just take a minute to orient you with the site plans. This is a little bit different than the slide Attorney Alter had up previously. Uh, this is our base survey. Silasteen Highway, uh, the railroad is to the top of the sheet. Uh, Maple Street, Route 3, is to the right. Uh, Middletown <coughs> Avenue is to the bottom. A residential neighborhood would be to the left. Uh, again, it's about a 5.4 acre site uh, comprised of the existing restaurant uh, supply warehouse. Uh, basically, one half of uh, the site area uh, between Middletown Avenue and the warehouse is an asphalt parking lot. Uh, the remainder is uh, pervious surface. Uh, the topography of the site basically slopes uh, from the west to the east. Uh, grades vary slightly, but generally through the center of that site, uh, it's about a 7% grade. Uh, there's two curb cuts uh, existing, uh, one from uh, Maple Street uh, and also one from uh, Middletown Avenue. Uh, so this is the proposed uh, site plan. Uh, the existing warehouse uh, is the large uh, brown uh, building. Uh, the smaller brown building is the proposed restaurant. Uh, as you can see, the restaurant is located in the northeast corner of the site. Um, again, Attorney Alter mentioned uh, we're seeking to move uh, or to create a 25 foot setback uh, versus the 50 uh, foot. Um, basically, we want to locate that restaurant, that building as close to the street as possible, Why? putting putting parking behind, trying to screen some of that parking. As, as we've done with other developments in town, um, again, it's just trying to create a better streetscape. Um, Again, it's a full-service restaurant, uh, approximately 224 seats. Uh, that's between the indoor dining and the bar area. Uh, another 24 uh, seats seasonal uh, on the patio. Uh, we're proposing to utilize the existing curb cuts, uh, again, from Maple Street and Middletown Avenue. Uh, currently, in that existing parking area, uh, there's uh, no traffic control, no islands. Um, we're creating numerous islands within that parking area, creating better traffic control. 
Uh, again, there's numerous uh, loading docks on the existing warehouse, so we do have to maintain a large truck maneuvering area. Uh, the darker gray area, uh, basically what that represents is truck pavement, um, but it gives you a sense of um, where we think, you know, or where the maneuvering areas are. Uh, the lighter gray is uh, just a distinction for passenger car parking, so just to clarify that. Um, the service drive for uh, and, and deliveries dumpster area for the proposed restaurant, that's located at the northwest corner of that building, closest to the Maple Street uh, entrance drive. Uh, the main entrance to the restaurant is located in the uh, southeast corner. Uh, that would be uh, along the Middletown Avenue uh, portion of that building. Uh, in terms of uh, connectivity with existing sidewalk systems, uh, we, we are creating a sidewalk and stair system uh, between the restaurant entrance and the existing sidewalk system on Middletown Avenue. We're also creating a new <coughs> sidewalk which parallels uh, the eastern edge of the parking area and then connects to the existing uh, Mill Street or Middletown Avenue. Uh, excuse me, sidewalk system just before the service drive. And that is uh, an accessible uh, sidewalk. Uh, there's no steps along that uh, section. Um, you'll also notice in the plan, uh, we have a five foot wide striped pedestrian walkway. Uh, that's basically connecting the parking on the southerly, uh, the newer parking area, that light gray area on the south side of the site, and that continues up through a uh, double loaded uh, parking bay, uh, which directs pedestrians to uh, the restaurant building. <coughs> now, Are I do. barriers along that sidewalk in the parking area? Uh, no. Why? I, I will get to that short. That's shortly. another why. Uh, I'll, two whys on that street. I'll, I'll get to you that short. <coughs> One thing I would like to point out to the commission uh, when we were addressing staff comments, uh, there's an area of the site. This portion right over here. Uh, you'll notice on the plans that were submitted uh, with the application. Uh, we didn't realize at the time, uh, but we violated a portion of the 25 foot landscape buffer. We were encroaching within that right at the angle point of that property line. So in addressing staff comments, we made a revision, uh, putting a curve into that drive aisle, into that parking lot, uh, reconfigured a couple of the islands uh, within that parking area. Uh, we reconfigured, added two spaces um, on the south side, one in the uh, along the frontage. So the parking overall count remained the same, but we're now in conformance with the 25-foot uh, setback to uh, the abutting residences. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention um, that there is a change. Um, we have also included, uh, and this was a staff comment, a bicycle rack uh, within the parking area. Um, we have 22 uh, islands, parking islands. Uh, one island is a striped island. So in terms of site grading, uh, I mentioned uh, previously, um, generally the site slopes from the west to the east, about a 7% grade through the center. Uh, in locating the proposed restaurant in that northeast corner, uh, basically the grades on the west end of the building control what the finished floor needs to be. 
So at the east end of the restaurant building, closest to the intersection, um, the finished floor is going to be about seven and a half feet higher than the existing grade. Uh, requ it requires a retaining wall. It's part <coughs> of the building footprint itself. Uh, one of the things uh, that came out during uh, our visit to Historic District, um, they en encouraged us to incorporate a tiered wall, which we thought was a great idea. We incorporated that. So we've pulled the face of that wall out about three feet. Uh, it follows that wall along Middletown Avenue and then wraps around on the Maple uh, Street side for you know, 25, 30 feet. Uh, again, three feet wide. Um, I'm putting some, and I'll, I'll get to that when I discuss landscaping, some broadleaf evergreen shrubs in there. Um, so from existing ground to the level of that first tier is about four feet. And then it's about another three and a half feet to uh, the outdoor patio elevation. And I know it, it's been brought to our attention, you know, when we mention, you know, seven and a half feet. Um, you know, I'm, I'm six foot four. I know seven and a half sounds like it's a tremendous amount, but it's really another foot or so over the top of my head. So, and with a tiered, I think it's going to, you know, aesthetically be okay. Um, but generally, uh, given the finished floor, the new finished floor of the building, we're able to uh, manipulate some of the grades in the parking lot. So we're, re we're going to be able to reduce that 7% grade uh, to about a 5% grade going from the warehouse towards Middletown Avenue. Uh, it does get a little steeper by the uh, entrance drive um, coming to Middletown Avenue and Maple Street's a little steeper than the 5 but bulk of that whole center area is going to be improved uh, and considerably flatter. Um, also, uh, with that building, uh, again, Attorney Alter mentioned uh, there's a portion of the site which is encumbered by a 100-year floodplain. Uh, again, we went to wetlands. Um, so this, this has all been approved. Um, we have no net bills, no loss of flood storage. Uh, what we were able to do is to create a detention pond and compensatory flood storage area. Uh, that's along Middletown Avenue, the south side of the south site, south of that service drive. Um, it's about two feet deep, the detention pond. <coughs> uh, in terms of utilities and storm drainage, um, all of the utilities, domestic, fire, water services, sanitary, telecom, electric, uh, gas, all those services are going to be coming uh, from uh, Route 3. Uh, basically, the service, mechanical rooms and all such are located generally near the service drive in the northwest corner of the building. Uh, we've located transformer and generator in that back area uh, as well. Uh, in terms of storm drainage, uh, again, the existing uh, site, uh, generally it's just sheet flow off of that parking lot towards Middletown Avenue. Uh, there's no water quality treatment. Uh, we're putting in new catch basins, water quality structures. We're going to clean that water uh, and then discharge to a system uh, in Middletown Avenue. On the southern part of the site uh, where we're adding additional parking, Again, that storm runoff is going to be collected in a catch basin, uh, water quality treatment system, and discharged to that detention basin. Uh, and again, from there, it'll connect to uh, basically the same system, but a different connection point uh, to an existing storm system in Middletown Avenue. Erosion control, uh, again along the perimeter of the site, we've got the typical standard uh, silt fencing, con stone construction entrance, uh, silt sacks and so forth as the drainage system is constructed and comes online uh, at all the catch basin structures. 
Um, we do have a sediment trap located in the south, uh, in the, in the, well, basically in the same area as the detention pond. Its initial function is going to be as a sediment trap. Uh, when that parking area is constructed, uh, all that storm runoff is directed to the sediment trap. Um, and then as construction advances, <coughs> it'll be converted to uh, its final condition as a detention pond. Uh, we're, we're showing a uh, location for a topsoil stockpile that has its own siltation control uh, around it. Uh, we do have uh, phasing narratives uh, for the phasing of the site for the construction, uh, as well as narratives for installation and maintenance of the erosion controls, both during and uh, after post-construction. With the snow uh, thing that the town engineer from Rocky Hill recommended, snow, snow storage? Uh, we did add a couple areas on the site plan. You do? Okay. Go on. And I believe we also added a rotation. I mean, that's, that's for lower st storm events, major, st larger storm events may have to be trucked away, but we, we did indicate a couple locations for snow storage. Uh, site landscaping. Um, I think everyone's familiar enough with the site uh, to know there's no landscaping within that existing parking area. Um, there are some major trees, sugar maples along Middletown Avenue, which we're going to preserve. Uh, they basically were in the fronts of the two houses that were uh, taken down. And then you have the pine trees along Middletown Avenue that wrap around the corner uh, of Maple Street. Um, again, we're, we're going to preserve the sugar maples that kind of form the basis of my idea for a whole new streetscape, build on the sugar maples, introduce more sugar maples going north, taking down those pines, incorporating some uh, flowering ornamentals, dogwood trees, uh, adding dogwood trees along uh, uh, Route 3 uh, street frontage, not only by the restaurant, but also moving westerly in front of the uh, warehouse. Uh, there are some existing shrubs um, which the owner uh, planted by the, uh, the warehouse building uh, along Route 3. We're going to do some major enhancements around the proposed restaurant. Um, I'll, I'll basically start um, by the detention pond and, and just work my way around the site. So um, again, starting the detention pond, um, again, I mentioned it's two feet deep. We're going to have a conservation mix in there, preserving those existing sugar maples, the deciduous trees going along Middletown Avenue. We know headlights and lighting uh, are a concern to the residents. That's one of the factors I took into consideration in designing the landscape plan. Along that parking lot, um, the easternmost edge, uh, I've got a hedge uh, of broadleaf evergreen shrubs. They'll grow three to four feet tall. There's also a timber guide rail um, along that easterly edge uh, on uh, the street side of um, the sidewalk. Um, that slope embankment is planted with low ground cover, uh, coniferous type vegetation, but it's low in growth on that two to one slope. Um, again, I mentioned about the tiered wall at the restaurant. That's going to be planted with a broadleaf evergreen shrub. Grows a couple feet tall. It'll turn, it won't lose its leaves totally. May lose some, but may not, it's not going to lose totally. It's going to turn a bronzy color. Uh, in the winter months. Coming up uh, Maple Street, moving westerly. Uh, again, I mentioned about the dogwoods. I've also got uh, some flowering viburnums, which flower in the spring uh, along that foundation wall, uh, as well as some lower evergreen type uh, shrubs. The service area, which I mentioned, uh, is at the northwest corner uh, of the restaurant building. Again, the dumpster uh, and the actual service is, is enclosed with a fence, um, which you'll hear uh, the, some material details 
a little bit later. The actual service drive itself, I've, I've uh, incorporated three multi-stem, they can be considered a large shrub or a small tree in the lank ears. Again, they uh, flower in the spring. Again, low uh, conifers to form a little type of a hedge. And then again, part of that slope will have a uh, broadleaf evergreen uh, embankment covering. So moving around the west side of the building, I'm going to advance one slide. This is a pretty intensive landscape treatment around the building. Uh, again, and, and, it, and these don't appear in the elevation views, which you'll see a bit later. Uh, but again, there's two more amelanch ears, one on the uh, left of that wall, one on the right side. This is again on the west side of the building. Uh, in that mix of plants, there's some junipers, uh, uh, ornamental grasses, a variety of perennials. So again, different textures, lots of color, vibrancy, uh, plants for various seasons. Uh, so that's, that's the, in the inside the parking lot at the northwest, southwest corner of the restaurant building? Yeah. That slide that I just showed you? Yeah. It's the building. Yeah, because you talked about the building. I just wanted to make yeah, sure I knew which building we were looking at. Yeah. Okay. So within the parking lot itself in those raised islands, um, uh, again, I have uh, maple trees, which will grow 40 to 50 feet <coughs> deciduous. Uh, the islands will be treated with mulch. Uh, the two landscaped islands nearest to the restaurant, they have a ground cover. Uh, broadleaf evergreen treatment within those. 40 to 50 foot of length of length for the islands? For trees. Is, isn't that what you just said? Yes. Did I mishear it? 40 or 50 feet high. Yeah, eventually. Right. You know, way down, 40 years from now. Yeah, right. Seems like birds can grow at midnight. It'll work, I'm sure, we wouldn't put it there. I feel confident. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen sidewalks that go up in the air around the town. That's all. I don't watch a lot of town. Where the trees mix with the salt. But they won't be walking up the street. Right in the town. Uh, so again, uh, moving to the south, uh, we have a pretty intensive landscape buffer uh, along the abutting residential zone in the residences. Uh, it's a staggered row of evergreen uh, conifers and deciduous trees. I think I've got some balsam firs, uh, white pines, um, so forth, uh, red oaks. Um, then moving uh, back towards the deten detention pond area, uh, between the parking area and the detention pond itself, uh, those are Norway spruces. It's a staggered row. They're planted about 15 feet on center. Uh, Norway spruce can be, they can, they can achieve heights <coughs> of 50, 60 feet. Uh, they have a pendulous branching system that hang down. Again, consideration of planting those trees in that area. Headlights, consideration for the neighbors and so forth. So I think over time, there's gonna be a pretty decent uh, screening of that parking lot uh, for the Why neighbors. That house? Well, the house to the south is going to get screened by that 25 foot wide that. buffer. Okay. The plants I'm talking about now are, you know, screening the parking area from Middletown Avenue. Oh, okay. All right. Got a little water in there. Captain, while you're at it. Um, how big are those proposed plantings? There's, I mean, I could go through each one. No, 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 not they're, they're, they're those all are foundation. There, the planted, the evergreens. Yeah, those are foundation six plants. Six to eight feet, okay. uh, three and a half inch caliper, major trees. So they're probably going to be in the 12 to 14 foot range of planting, a three and a half inch caliper you know, red oak or tupelo. Um, so there'll be some substantial 
size to these plants. They're not going to be a one inch caliber tree or a three or four foot conifer. I mean, these are six to eight foot trees that I'm specking. Thank you. Again, trying to get more screening initially. But again, it is all spelled out and the ultimate heights are all spelled out uh, on that chart. So along Middletown Avenue, you're going to replace the pine trees with sugar maples? Sugar maples and dogwoods, right? Deciduous trees. Deciduous. Because I, you know, not to get too far into it, but I seem to recall when we were having one of our prior hearings, there were lights on the warehouse building that were blocked by those trees that might not work if you have trees without leaves this time. Well, we, we have talked to the owner. Those lights were changed. Okay. Um, again, I think the town planner can add some more information to that, but I believe uh, he had a part in selecting the lights that are currently on the warehouse <coughs> building, and they should be downcast lights. I mean, there may have been a problem with lights previously, um, but from what we understand now, they have been switched out. Um, again, I mentioned about conservation uh, seeding of the detention pond, um, and I typically always specify a fescue mix for lawn areas uh, that typically requires less water demands than a bluegrass and so forth. Um, and again, looking at the plant list, I'm not going to say all the plants are natives, but I try and put in as many native species as I can or cultivars of uh, native species. Um. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, in the past hearing, one of the property owners, uh, item of property number 28, that's in the notch here in the southeast corner, he had talked about water runoff from up, up the hill, Silestine Highway Way, railroad tracks, whatnot. So with your improved grading, the detention pond on the landscape, that'll uh, probably help that situation out. What's your impact with this? Yeah, can, can we stay on that, please? and create a little bit of a soil. So I, I think we should be taking, you know, water away that he might be experiencing now. Is your drainage area essentially the property line, your property line? So you're not taking any water from that area? We're not. Right. It's the drainage that we have. We can get uh, mm -hmm. that water off in the soil. <clears throat> right. I'm just like this. So to answer your question, no. Right, yeah, because so historically there was probably little, if any, control if we go back from the beginning of time of this property. So I'm going to uh, waivers. Always my favorite topic. <laughs> Stop asking for them then. It's, a, it, it's, 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 it's it, only it, one page of them this time. It's a small list. <laughs> painting one tree on the pond. Well, I have to clarify again. Okay. Um, okay, so in terms of landscaping, there's four waivers. Um, one is screening of the loading area. Now, this really pertains to the existing warehouse. It's an existing condition. Technically, I don't know if we have to ask for it, but we did. Um, there's really nothing we can do to screen those loading doors from view uh, without impeding the truck circulation. Um, but again, I, I discussed the landscaping of the loading area and service drive for the proposed restaurant. So I think I'm, I'm covered there. So really, this waiver for the loading zone pertains to the existing warehouse. 15% um, internal green space. Uh, again, um, going back to the site plan. I mentioned about the different colors of the gray. 
um, that dark gray, the truck maneuvering area. Um, it has a lot of, it's not really, in my opinion, a parking, but it is and it isn't. We included it, um, but it bumps the numbers up, so I, I can't meet the 15% internal green. Um, but it's really that truck maneuvering area that distorts the numbers. Um, so I'm asking for a waiver. What, what is the number that you achieved? Uh, we're required to have 11,357. Uh, we have 4,836 seeking a waiver for 6,521. You did a waiver. I realize that. I did consult with the planner. I tried to get away from it just to include the parking, but <laughs> he wouldn't let me do it. <laughs> well, just by general, you know, size of the area, it looks like half of it is the truck stuff, perhaps a little less. So you'd, you'd be short even in the area you were. I, I would still I would still be short, but <coughs> it would be a smaller gap <coughs> okay. than what I'm asking for. Um, so, uh, ter terminal islands, each row of parking is required to have a terminal island. Um, we have one striped island. Um, we, we, elim we eliminated that island, uh, made it striping. Uh, again, the owner was concerned with truck maneuvering, even though we can demonstrate with turning templates that we can avoid it. He feels better if we made that a striped island. Um, again, is that, is that that conic striping? Yes, right, right in the middle. Yeah, it's kind of right in the middle there. Yeah, it's right in the middle. Yeah. <coughs> well, yeah, I think that's the only place it's right. <coughs> So we're seeking a waiver for one terminal raised island. Um, obviously that's where the one tree uh, waiver originates from. Uh, again, in addressing staff comments about mechanicals, transformer generators, so forth, um, on the west side of uh, the restaurant, uh, the northern island right by the service drive, there was a tree in there but when we addressed comments and did the transformer, um, we had to eliminate the tree. Um, so I do need to make a clarification and seek a waiver for two trees in two islands. Um, but that's the extent of the landscape waivers. Just so I understand, how do you count 22 islands? Well, it's all the internal and then ends by the service drive. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. We should we count the islands as the things in the middle of that even? Uh, it's only one row. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if you follow me. Ten islands? Yeah. What, the peninsula? They're more peninsulas than anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I think, I think the center was the cliff loaded. So yeah. You have four there. You've got right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I got up to like 12, but I wasn't counting the little hang. I, I think if they were separated, we made the distinction that they were a separate island. <laughs> um, so, again, I think Attorney Alter uh, covered these two. Um, one was the setback from 50 feet to 25, uh, and then there's a portion of parking space. Again, this is existing as a warehouse. It's over here. Um, it's, it's in existing condition, but part of it is within the front yard setback. I'm not sure if that was previously granted a waiver or not. Um, so that's also something that we were requesting. Uh, 
uh, site lighting. Uh, it, it's LED, uh, all the fixtures. Um, you'll see on the right-hand side of the sheet, there's a uh, catalog cut of what the fixture looks like. Uh, we call it a shepherd's crook at the top. Basically, it's a 16-foot pole mounted on a two-foot concrete base. Um, the luminaire itself will be mounted at 18 feet, but again, with the crook of the fixture, uh, it raises the overall height to 21 feet. Uh, they are full cutoff. Um, catalog cut indicates um, a green finish. We're probably looking at black. If we look at the architectural plans, um, they're indicating a black finish, uh, so we'd want to have that uniform. Um, but the fixture that we're proposing kind of picks up on the theme of what the architect is proposing on the building as well. Um, when we went to design review, uh, there was a lot of discussion again about lights, neighborhood. I, I've mentioned, you know, we've I've done with plants what I could for headlights. Um, we did have more fixtures, poles within the parking lot. We have reduced. Um, one of the things I talked to Apex Lighting about, um, I'll submit this, uh, pass it around. Um, on the luminaire itself is to put what they call a soft view lens. Um, basically, it softens the glare from the lights. So again, it's an added feature that we're uh, trying to incorporate um, for that lighting. But again, everything is full cut off. Um, staff comments. Um, again, there were comments from uh, Town of Rocky Hill, Town Engineer, uh, planning department. Uh, we did issue a uh, response to comments. Um, both letters were dated December 16th, 2019. Um, I think we addressed all the comments, either incorporated them or had a response. All but two comments. Um, One comment had to do with that striped pedestrian walkway that I mentioned running from the south side of the site through the center. Um, I, I believe the concern is, uh, or the belief is that cars can pull up, encroach within that five foot pedestrian walkway, um, that we should consider adding curbs or wheel stops or some other mechanism, bollards or whatever. Um, we could do curbs. Um, we'd have to add more drainage structures, more drainage piping. Um, if you introduce a raised curb, then you got to pick up the sidewalk, then you add more handicap ramps in the middle. You're up, you're down. Uh, if you did not do the curbs and you did the wheel stops, <coughs> in our opinion, curb stops are going to be a tripping hazard. Uh, they're going to be a maintenance snow plowing <laughs> nightmare. They're probably going to get ripped out. Um, so our opinion is we'd prefer to leave it with just a striped island. Um, you know, we're not saying there's not going to be any encroachment within that five feet. There possibly will be. Um, you know, it's not meant to convey a wheelchair through there. Uh, we do have ample handicap parking immediately adjacent. Uh, to the restaurant. Um, so our position is we'd like to keep that or we eliminate it and just let people walk through a drive aisle back of the cars or whatever. Basically the same situation you would have as you would find at a shopping center. Um, Kevin, I like to see walkways. I think our shopping centers don't have enough of them. The other comment, um, which we responded to, but we did not incorporate, uh, had to do with the introduction of 
uh, ADA tactile strips at the service driveway at Middletown Avenue, the site driveway in Middletown Avenue. Um, basically add a tactile strip on the north and south sides of the sidewalk at the site drive. Um, our office contacted, well, Mr. Garrow contacted uh, the ADA compliance board. Um, basically their position is they only encourage the use of those strips if there's a change in grade or heavy use of that driveway. Um, in this condition, the, we don't meet either criteria. It's not a heavy use driveway uh, and we don't have a change in grade. It's a continuous grade across. Um, so we're proposing to leave it as is. Without the tactile so strips. No heavy use, even post construction. Well, I think heavy use means, you know, one vehicle right after another. That it would be, you know, problematic for someone crossing the drive. So, um, I think at this point that concludes my comments, and I'm going to turn it over. Oh, I see uh, a hand. Excuse me, I have just one uh, sure. quick question uh, back to the lighting plan. And uh, the question I have, have relates to the uh, intensity of the lighting utilization over time. Will all, how, at what hours will all the lights be on at all times or, or not on at all times? And which won't be and which will. <coughs> There'll be on a timer that's dictated by when it will at dusk and dawn. So the lights, at least on the building, I'm not speaking for the polar lights, they'll be on a time basis. So we, we haven't actually determined exactly what time they'll go on and off. But we'll set it to the appropriate time the best we can. That's, that's the building lights. What about the pole lights? That I'm not sure. I'm told the parking lot will be on a timer. Building lights will be on all the time. Would would be reasonable to presume that uh, uh, the lights in the parking area would be off when the restaurant is not in operation? But not not all 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 through the night. Right. And for the record, that was the owner, Joe Sulo. <coughs> I presume so. <laughs> for the record. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think other times we've, we've talked about you know either half hour or an half hour after close, just so that people who are working there and finishing up can, you know, still have the benefit of light to leave for security reasons. But you're not lighting the whole neighborhood at 4.30 in the morning. <coughs> Does have someone coming after you? Yes, so that concludes my comments. I'm gonna turn it over to Jim Bubaris, our traffic engineer. So, oh, so before you go, because <coughs> um, I think you're gonna end up being the right, bot, right person or, or Corey. How many people are speaking in the microphone? Sorry, I was the one who uh, made the comment say. before, right? <laughs> um, so how many parking spaces do we need for the site? And where I'm heading here, because that probably is a, a Jim comment, the building is way, too, way up front on the property. You're asking for a waiver of it. George spouted it before, but it's on everybody's mind. Why? Why does it have to be where it is so close to the road? You can answer that. We need, for the record again, we need 143 parking. We have 148, so okay. we have five extra. Thank you. The, the location of the building um, was done purposely to create uh, a gateway effect for the property and to take advantage of what we think is, or an expectation that's been expressed to us that parking and uh, those kinds of uh, uses of the property should be to the side and to the rear rather than the old strip center 
situation where you have all the parking along the street and then you have the building behind it what we tried to do here was to create a streetscape along middletown avenue all of kevin's landscaping and the design of the wall and and the creation of uh, a separate uh, restaurant presence was all directed at creating a streetscape in that area could we put this restaurant somewhere else on the site and and do that we would but then all of the parking would be would have to be in front of the building and and along Middletown Avenue and along Maple Street and that's counter to at least what I understand the policies that have been expressed along the Silas Dean Highway uh, in your in your the plans that you have for there which is not to create parking directly along street lines to create a streetscape of buildings um, the, 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 the other part of that, the other part that was driven by that was our intention that towards the south, towards the Middletown Avenue residential area, we wanted to put the green spaces that we're developing, the stormwater drainage, and, and also to create the 25-foot buffer. If we put the restaurant towards that side of the property, it's closer to the residential uses. At this point, we're as far away as we can get from the, the residences further down Middletown Avenue. It, it makes the most sense. The, other, the second part of that is that it's consistent with what's there already. The building, the warehouse building is 26 feet from Maple Street at its nearest point. The building across, the judicial department building across the street is 27 feet from Maple Street. So to impose a 50 foot setback is <coughs> counter to what you already have there. So it becomes inconsistent to do that. Could we do it? Sure, we can do it. If you tell us you wanted 50 feet back, we'll move it 50 feet back. But there's going to be a greater imposition to the south, and there's going to have to be parking that is, is much closer to and, and, and uh, intrusive upon Middletown Avenue, which was our impression nobody wanted. I, we think. This design speaks to exactly what somebody would want as a streetscape rather than a parking lot. But that's this commission's decision. We understood that it was uh, your intention not to create parking lots along streets, that you wanted buildings and streetscapes. If we've misunderstood that, then we've been going down the wrong road for a long time. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I get concerned with this setback issue too. And I don't mean we go back 50 feet, but I think what they are proposing is a little shallow. And uh, I get concerned. I'm not a traffic engineer. I'm not an engineer for State Department of Transportation, but I have a great interest in these matters of this is the most dangerous at the top of the hill intersection within two miles or maybe four miles and a railroad track running across. The DOT may someday want to do better access like they have just to the east of Middletown Ave to get to 91 to this intersection. <coughs> and these shallow setbacks on both sides, as you just suggested they are, or would, could be, are a little bit too shallow and for future widening even 10 feet on that section of road of this street. I, it bothers me a lot. And it is congested in there. And uh, I have some concerns about the turning and so forth off of Route 3 and beyond. And the last. Well, those are, th those are the, uh, we, we've used, used, utilized the existing driveway cuts. Um, we want to be further away from the intersection, and, and, and we are as far as, as far away from the intersection as we can be given the, the location of the large building. And the Middletown Avenue driveway, again, was located far enough away from that intersection. The reality, Mr. Oichel, is that it's, at least in my opinion, very unlikely that the state of Connecticut will ever widen that portion of Route 3. They would. They would have to take property that is uh, where the judicial building is. They'd have to take the parking lot at the Carlin building. They'd have to take away almost all of the 
access to the automotive facility that's on the west side of the were railroad tracks and they would probably eliminate the gas station to do it that the idea that the state would take that kind of taking is is at least in my opinion not realistic so that area is will never be widened in any manner I would be startled if the state of Connecticut would expend the kind of money it would have to to do those kinds of take you're talking about the future well that's what you were talking about yeah sure so so are there other big questions on the site I think we agree with George but I think we have a traffic engineer yeah that's good sir the overview so why don't we continue the presentation and see where we're going with this I will I will ask however that if there's some big topics for the site right because that's what we're talking about that's why I wanted to ask the question about its location up front before we get into the traffic this yeah I have a quick question related to that so the the setback to 3 Street is reversed but the setback to Middletown Ave is is that 28 feet is that chosen because of the parking spaces is that the design criteria or is it because of the loading dock like could was why was the 28 feet chosen I suppose is my question like I'm just curious why it's there and is it because of those parking spaces that they seem in excess of what we need but is it more related to the turning it's the configuration of the loading docks that already exist and the fact that trucks have to be able to access that not the loading dock to the restaurant no the loading dock to the restaurant is not the controlling factor the controlling factor for the circulation of traffic is that trucks have to be able to manipulate to get to the loading docks yeah we would not slide we couldn't slide it directly west uh, without compromising the driveway that accesses Maple Street you mentioned this is a gateway concept is it a marketing concept uh, an image thing uh, an entrance to the Wethersfield meaning if I was a restaurant owner would it is it complimentary with more of a, a traffic image thing that you, you're captivating the traffic pattern the number of cars coming through the possible uh, customers coming in by having it close to the road versus setting it back 50 or 60 feet is, it, is, is that relevant is that what you're calling it a gateway? I think th no. I'm calling it a gateway because, at least in my mind, when when you come off of 91 or you come across the Putnam Bridge, you you're entering Weathersfield when you cross. At least to me, when you cross Middletown Avenue, you're you're through the the meadow and 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 now you're you're coming into Weathersfield. So I view this as the entrance to this part of Weathersfield, um, and that's the relevance that I. That, that I refer to it as, as, as a gateway building. Uh, is it better for the restaurant to be visible? I, I think the answer is yes. Um, our experience, uh, the other uh, artisanal burger company that's in Manchester is at the end of the mall there at the bottom of the Buckland Hill uh, property. Um, it's very popular and does well because they do a good job. You go to a restaurant once because you saw it and it looked interesting. You don't go back unless you have a good experience there, no matter how interesting it looks. And, and uh, Mr. Sulo and his partner have been able to create a, a brand that people, that people return to on a regular basis. So <coughs> is it on an on a early attraction basis it's important to be visible long term people will find good restaurants um, as they have in Manchester um, and, and with uh, Mr. Cooper's other restaurants certainly uh, if you want we can move on to Jim Barris if there are any other sure. site questions that's fine Good evening. I'm Jim Boo Barris. I'm a
principal in uh, Bubaris Traffic Associates. We're traffic engineering consultants located in Wallingford, Wallingford, Connecticut. We prepared the original traffic study for this project, which is dated November 25th, 2019, and then did an update to that, which I'll explain later, which is dated December 5th, 2019. What we have here, as has been mentioned, is you have Maple Street, which is uh, Connecticut Route 3, running east-west, and you have Middletown Avenue running north-south. And they intersect at a signalized intersection, which is fully actuated in control. It has a pedestrian crossing across the, the west and the north legs. It has dedicated turn lanes on each of the approaches. And from what we understand, there was a meeting that the DOT had with the town back in March of 2019, where they discussed their intention, the DOT's intention, to replace this traffic signal with uh, upgraded equipment, uh, going to a box span arrangement versus the old type span arrangement that you have there, which is basically a Y. It'll be a box span arrangement where the signal heads are further away from the stop bars. And they'll put in new equipment, and uh, probably the best feature that's going to come out of it is they'll have video detection, which is a lot more uh, accurate and more responsive to uh, what the traffic demand is. The uh, situation stays pretty much as it is, as was discussed. You'll have a north, the north drive remaining on the no north side of the site, which is on Maple Street west of the intersection. And you'll have the east drive, which will re remain, which is at the east end of the site, south of the intersection. And both of those inter both of those site drives will remain as they are. They're one way in, one way out, uh, one lane uh, out, which it means that the left turns uh, and right turns coming out of the site drives uh, need to be made for out of one uh, one uh, lane, which is good because that way, if you have two lanes coming out. Usually, they're competing as to who's got the sight line and they interfere with each other. So having one lane is a better situation. Uh, the restaurant that we're speaking about is 6,000 square feet. It's proposed to have 248 seats. And as was <coughs> mentioned, will be 149 parking spaces. When we do, uh, well, I'll get into the trip generation later. The first thing we did is we did traffic counts out there to see what we have at that intersection. And what we did is we didn't use people to do the counts. Well, we did, but we didn't have people out there doing turning movement counts, and we didn't use road tubes to do the counts. What we did is we used video detection. What we did is we installed a camera at the northeast corner of the intersection of Maple Street and um, Middletown Avenue and positioned it up there so that you could see these three intersections that intersection plus the two site drives. And we did it over a period of time. And from it, what we were particularly interested in uh, were the AM peak on a weekday, the PM peak on a weekday, and the mid middle day peak on a Saturday. And why do we pick those peaks? What traffic engineers do is they look at the worst case scenario, and if they can demonstrate that the situation will work for the worst case. It's intuitive that it will also work for anything that doesn't carry that much traffic. So we look at the AM peak and the PM peak because typically the distributions are different. In the morning, you'll have the traffic move in one way. That'll be the preferential movement. In the evening, you'll have the reverse. And we look at the Saturday because you usually have the retail component of a situation of a study area added into it. So we did those counts in mid-March, and uh, we looked at the, the weekday peak. What we isolated was the 7 to 9 a.m. in the morning, the 4 to 6 p.m. in the evening, and on Saturday we looked at L, uh, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And those were done in 2019, and then we grew them two years hence, and we used a, a pretty hefty growth factor of 2% per year to show what the, to, to, to estimate what the traffic will be, the background conditions will be before this restaurant is added, is, is added in. Now where I missed the boat was, I remember that the Borden project down the street 
was in the works because I had incorporated it into another study I had done a few years back in this town. I thought when we did these counts that that was already in play, but it wasn't. And your town planner in, in reviewing the original study pointed out that we didn't incorporate anything from the Borden study into our analysis. So we went back and we added that information into our, our, uh, our analysis and redid the study. The good news is it didn't change anything. The levels of service we came up with remained the same. So what we did for trip generation, uh, we traffic engineers have uh, this professional society that represents us. It's called the Institute of Transportation Engineers. And what they do is they provide us with a wealth of information based on studies that others do around, around the country. And then they're provided to them and they assemble them and they make them available to the members of the profession. One of those documents is called the Trip Generation Manual, which is about this thick. Uh, and it has various trip generation data in it for various land uses uh, based on various independent variables, independent variables for determining what that particular land use will generate. In the case of a restaurant, and we consider this to be a quality sit-down restaurant, to be clear, it's going to operate seven days a week for lunchtime and for dinner time. And um, the trip generation factors that are in this document for a quality restaurant such as this are based on either the size of the building that houses it or the number of seats that were in, are, are in the restaurant for dining purposes. Uh, we did an analysis in our original study that compared both of them to see which one was going to give us the higher number. And as I expected, because it typically does, it was the number of seats that usually is the more reliable factor. It gives you the more conservative number. And by that, I mean the higher number. So we came up with the estimate. And for the number of seats that are proposed here, you'll only get five trips during the AM peak, you'll get about 69 trips during the PM peak, and you'll get 82 trips during the Saturday peak. And that is over a one hour period. And by a trip, we mean a one way movement either to or from the restaurant. That's how a trip is defined. So that, that's the amount of traffic that's gonna be added. Obviously, it's a very low traffic generator. Restaurants typically, unless it's a as you know, it's a, a, a fast food restaurant with a drive-thru. Uh, they generate quite a bit of traffic. But typically, a quality sit-down restaurant that doesn't have a high turnover are not a high traffic generator. We then needed to distribute the traffic to the roadway system that we have before way. And we defined the roadway system that we looked at specifically because of the low trip generation as the intersection of Maple and Middletown and the two site drives. So what we did to distribute the traffic, what we find to be the best means of distributing it, unless something else is available to us, is we look at the entering traffic to the system during those peak periods. So we looked at the AM peak, we looked at the PM peak, and we also looked at the Saturday peak, and then took the average of all the proportions that are entering the system during those peak periods. And what we found, and what we assume will happen here with the restaurant, is that 44% will be oriented to and from the west. That's from Silas Dean. 40% will be oriented to and from the east, and that is, let's say, the Putnam Bridge area. 12% will be oriented to from the south, that's Middletown Avenue. And 4% will be oriented to and from the north, that's Spring Street. If you flip these numbers around and change it and say it's not, it's 50% or 60%, it really is not going to change the magnitude of what's being added to the system. It's still a relatively low number. But the best guess we have as to how it's going to distribute it is, is what I just said, in my opinion, and in traffic engineers' opinion in, in, in general. So what we did is we took that amount of traffic, added it to the system, and then did a before and after analysis to see what we have. 
And what we traffic engineers use is the highway capacity manual, which gives you a, a methodology for evaluating traffic operations at either a roadway, at an intersection, taking into consideration the traffic control, the amount of traffic, the number of lanes, and uh, if with the signal, how it, how it uh, proportions the amount of green time over the course of time. And then we rate it based on delay. It's all delay driven. So depending on the amount of delay produced on average for the vehicles that are approaching the intersection, you come up with a ranking system. The lower the delay, the better the operation. So you give it a higher rating. And what we use for the rating is just like going to school. We rank everything from A to F. And just like school, A is excellent and F is not very good. And we rate them. And what we try to achieve is to try to get something we hope in, and in, in this day and age, and the reality of what we're facing today with all the traffic that's out there, is uh, we're hoping to achieve a, a level of service Z, C, okay? Uh, we usually get a D and an E. Uh, we're very lucky if we get an A or a B. And what we did is we evaluated these three intersections and for north, the North Drive at uh, Maple Street, we got an A to a C, depending on which movement you look at. And we looked at all the movements entering the intersection. At the intersection of Maple and Middletown, which is signalized, we got a B to a C. And at the East Drive, we got an A to a B. And uh, that's very good levels of service, okay? I wish all the traffic studies came out like, uh, as this does. So in our evaluation, we determined that the amount of traffic being added to the system as a result of this proposed use is not gonna change the level of service, and you've already got very good levels of service at those three intersections. We then looked at the sight lines. We looked at the sight lines exiting and approaching each of the two sight drives to see what we had, and we also took into account what the, what, what the DOT recommends the minimum sight line should be. And again, from data that they've accumulated over time and that are recommended by the various profes professions that give us this, this, uh, this data. And the sight lines at the North Drive are 700 feet in either direction. That's very good. And they're good for 60 miles an hour. And you don't have 60 miles an hour. 60 miles an hour. And you don't have 60 miles an hour on they Maple Avenue. Really no, they, no, they try. No, no, they're good for 60 miles an hour. I'm not saying they're going 60 miles an hour, okay? Let's be clear about that, okay? Actually, a study done by the DOT uh, determined that they're going through there at 40 miles an hour as an 85th percentile, okay? But they're good for 60 miles an hour. And then uh, on the east side drive, uh, they measured 465 feet to and from the south and 580 feet to and from the north, which are good to for 40 to 50 miles per hour. So the sight lines are very good. You have an 85th for Middletown now? Excuse me? Do you have an 85th for Middletown? I do not, but I, I would venture to say it's posted for 35. I would venture to say it's probably probably 40. Okay. Uh, 40 coming in before they're stopped at the signal. And, of course, if they're coming down Spring Street and they don't stop, they're probably going through there southbound at 40 miles an hour. Uh, we then looked at the traffic crash experience, and we don't call them accidents anymore because an accident uh, implies that uh, the driver had nothing to do with it, uh, whereas <laughs> most of the time the driver has everything to do with it. But anyway, we call, we call them crashes now. Uh, the intersection and this study area has a very good <coughs> accident traffic crash experience. I'm an old timer, so I still call it accidents. Uh, we look to see what has been 
there for at least a four to five year period. And we're looking to see if we have any particular type of accident that occur occurs more than five times a year. Uh, and we're looking to see if there's a, a, a relationship between, a correlation between the type of accident we're getting and what's happening out there. Now typically at a signalized intersection, you get rear end accidents because people aren't paying attention. Person in front stops, the car behind doesn't, and you get rear end accidents. Signalized intersections solve right angle problems, but they create, create rear end problems. But anyway, over a course of four year period, and these, these, these accidents now, I should give you a background on it, come from a combination of what is uh, produced by all the police departments in Connecticut and provided to the, uh, it's now at the University of Connecticut, they have a traffic <coughs> crash deposito, depository. It used to be the DOT that did this. Now it's the University of Connecticut that has it. And they're the holders, holders of the data. So when you need to look at accident, uh, uh, traffic crash experience, you go to this source, it's online, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to, to, to manipulate, and you go through it and you look at the site that you're talking about and you come up with the record. Now for the particular intersection here of Middletown and Maple, uh, there were 11 crashes over a four year period. Six were rear end, two were right angle, two were head on, and when I say head on, that sounds really drastic. What that was was two you know, opposing left turners getting themselves into a situation in the middle of the intersection. It wasn't that they came right at each other like this. And then one, somebody drove off a road and hit a fixed object. That, uh, that traffic crash experience does not indicate that you have a problem here. I mean, <coughs> no crashes are good, but this is not an alarming, it's, it's actually a, a very good experience, and it doesn't demonstrate that there's a, there's a situation here that needs, needs to be dealt with. So, having said what I have said, um, my conclusions are as follows. Reminder, the restaurant will be open seven days a week for lunch and dinner. It's a low traffic generator generating from something in the magnitude of uh, 69 to 82 trips per hour during the peaks, uh, which in this particular case on a, a, a weekday PM and a Saturday midday, which are uh, a dinner and a lunch. And that is a, considered a low traffic generator. It's only one to one and a half trips per minute during the peak hours. <coughs> the traffic operations, as we've rated them, are negligibly impacted. They remain at A to C levels of service. A is considered excellent. C is considered good. So uh, that's, that's a very excellent situation. The traffic crashes do not show an experience or a pattern that needs to be corrected or that will be exacerbated by adding the restaurant use here. And instantly I should mention that when we did the counts that we did at the two site drives, the existing site drives, they generate very little traffic. Okay? They, they, it, it, it's barely there, but it's, it generates some traffic. Uh, the available sight lines are satisfactory <coughs> and we don't find the need for any improvements in order to uh, solve a problem that might be there, a traffic control or a geometric problem that exists or that might, might be exacerbated by adding this little amount of traffic. So that's my presentation unless you have some questions. Just for a point of, I'm sorry, just for a point of reference, what is the traffic count, the background traffic count on each of the two roads now without this coming in? Because, I mean, you talked about uh, 69 and 82 and so forth. I mean, Ma Ma Maple, Maple carries 22,000 vehicles a day. I have not seen a count for, for uh, May, uh, 
for Middletown Avenue, but based on the peak hours that we did measure, I would, I would estimate it could carry something at about 4,000 a day. Okay, so, <coughs> so the more important one though would be the peak, <coughs> would be the peak numbers, right? It's so 22,000, the peak is 2,200 compared to 69 people trying to come in and out. Exactly. Right, so and, and on 4,000, <coughs> on 4,000 it's 400 in the peak compared to those same numbers coming out, right? Right, with only 12% probably right. added to. Not, not a daily number, but the peak, yeah. the peak is a 10%-ish type number. Correct. Right? By the way, nicely done. I haven't heard a, a traffic refresher course like that in a long yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our, our attorney uh, uh, told me that uh, we, we, we needed to, to, to give the, the longer presentation tonight. So, so, oh, you so mean he thinks we don't understand? <laughs> no, no. no, no. <laughs> so on the Silestein, excuse me, on Route 3, peak hours that you studied, you're estimating about 2,200 cars would pass this driveway during the one 60-minute period, more or less? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. And I guess having driven that road a lot, I, can you just explain if we've got a car coming, traveling west, on, on uh, Maple Route 3 coming from the Putnam Bridge, as you know, as you get to the Spring Street Middletown Avenue exit heading west, there's a dedicated left turn lane to go on to Middletown Avenue. But once you are past that, you've now basically just got your two lanes headed you west. So if somebody lanes. coming that way wants to turn in to the Route 3 uh, entrance into this site how how's that how's that going to work at peak when there's lots of cars coming in that direction in both lines i guess more specifically what's going to happen to that left lane if one or two cars have their signals on and they're trying to turn into the site well they're, they're, there's two through lanes they're going to stop in the left of the two and right. they're going to turn left into the site when they get the opportunity to do it what i've observed the video situation for doing the counts enables you then to go back and actually view it over time and you know look at a whole series of events. You can watch not only the peaks that you counted and evaluate it, but also everything that's happened in between. So I looked at the video and I watched it and all that, and there's plenty of opportunities for somebody doing just what you said when they're coming westbound and they stop to make a left turn into the site, the signal that's up at Silas Dean gaps things up, all right? So there are opportunities, for, there's breaks in the eastbound traffic that, that, that's opposing them to make that left turn, okay? So, so it's not like they're gonna be sitting there a long time before they get an opportunity to make that left right, turn. Right, unless, unless the people coming toward the Putnam Bridge, you know, occasionally, not all the time, but especially if there's an issue on I-91, and you get more traffic around here, I mean, it can sometimes get backed up from the railroad tracks to the light at certain times. But again, just to, just to do a little math here, which I'm not that good at, yeah. if you've got 2,200 cars <coughs> in the peak hour and you divide that by 60 minutes in an hour, you could have 35 to 40 cars every minute, basically, right? Well, half of, half of which are going way, half eastbound, half of which are going westbound. Okay, so yeah. I guess you know, even of, perhaps even well, equally or maybe more, how about the case of the person who's trying to make a left turn onto Route 3 westbound? I, you know, I guess one way to look at it is they have to stay in the parking lot until they can make the move. They're not impeding traffic there. It's more a question of how they get into the traffic, right? Yeah, well, they're, they're gonna give up and take a right. And right. Would you, did you That's consider having an internal sign that says right turns only exiting onto Route 3? Is that something you consider? The, the levels of service do not show that that's a problem making that left turn, all right? There are breaks, why, in the traffic so you can make it? Correct, uh, the there are line. breaks in the tra traffic. What we do, when we do the analysis, we use this software that's been developed, it's called Synchro, that's been developed which en enables us to build a model and we build the model and it has all sorts of ways of accounting for everything that's out there. It, okay? Westbound traffic at four o'clock in the afternoon and five o'clock. 
sometimes backs up almost another town there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The westbound or the eastbound? The westbound going up to the Silas B. Okay. We've never seen it backed up in this video that we did, which was yeah. over, no. Oh. It never, it never reached. It never got it, over the track. It never got over the track. I'm not in saying it morning. doesn't happen. In the morning it does. Uh, yeah. But we didn't see it. So, but, but then again, if it's, if it's the morning, he, he, he knows better because he lives here, okay? And the restaurant's not open in the morning. No, you, we're talking about noon time to three or whatever on the Thursday. So. Yeah, I guess. Time, I guess. Well, the retiree afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, you want to finish here? Just, just to go back to the to the person coming from Glastonbury taking a left into the site from Route Three. I think my concern is more. <coughs> there, there's lots of people who coming over the Putnam Bridge don't realize or don't care that the speed limit is no longer 55 and now it's 40 and if they get a clear green light across Middletown Avenue I mean I think I've seen cars next to me you know going 50 55 occasionally 60 miles an hour through there so I guess the concern is is that kind of car when it happens going to catch the person who's waiting are they going to see the person waiting to turn left into this site if they're speeding up the left lane, you know, that, that's, and what's the, what's the sight line like for them? You know, part of it, I guess, is the sight line and part of it is the speed. And if, if I can add to that is so like, if you turn that into that de facto left turn lane, how much storage can you really think you have before you start backing up into that intersection? It's cause it's, cause then it makes the situation that he's talking about, which, which is one car turns into two, three, however many, <coughs> because people don't realize he's turning, they think it's just traffic, and then you're back into the intersection. So just to add another wrinkle to his question. That's right, or, or if those people who are coming up the left lane really fast see it quickly, panic, try to move right very quickly into the right lane, and they've got people coming up as well. Again, I'm not saying that any of that happens. Uh, again, there's other businesses going up on the same side of the street where the same thing could be happening. Right, right, right now, exactly. so I don't mean to say this is the only place. But right. I, my my reaction, and I should be letting the applicant say it, but right, they're turning into pops today, right? Same situation, right? And and uh, yes, and and I suspect I suspect that the second time you go there, you will turn on to Middletown right. before <laughs> it, right? <laughs> and use the signal to give you the left turn. Yeah. <coughs> What was the site? How what was the distance easterly from that northern driveway? Like five, six hundred feet to the east. To the to on the Naple. On Route Three. Uh, it's about a hundred. How far is it from uh, the, the intersection to the North Drive? No, the sight line from. Oh, the sight line seven hundred feet. Right. So, kind of coupling this back to the positioning of the building, because this is a very ornate. You're not going to miss this thing coming down the road if you're coming from Glastonbury. So I'm kind of thinking if you have 700 feet of visibility, we see this building that you cannot miss. Never mind the facade on the warehouse that is the most ornate facade on a warehouse that I've seen recently. <laughs> uh, it helped. Would you think it would help that driver with that 700 feet of decision making, citing this building because it's its location on the on the site, to get into that left turn lane to turn onto Middletown Avenue and then to use the Middletown Avenue? Because it helped them in their decision making, rather than using the northern driveway of this property. I think the first time they're going to come here, they're going to use the northern driveway. The second time they come here, they're probably going to turn left onto Middletown and come in on the east drive. But the high visibility of this building could it be a positive impact in the decision making from the people traveling west from Glastonbury, so they utilize a signal? That's kind of what I'm saying. I'll say yes. I, I think it will help. <coughs> George? Uh, do you see a need for a left turn lane northbound on Middletown Ave into the middle uh, Middletown driveway? It's pretty wide there. You I mean, think you mean a separate that. left turn lane? Yeah. Uh, no. A, a marking, street marking to do it. No. And there are certain like guidelines. There are certain guidelines that we looked at, and, and they happen to be the DOD design manual. And when, to determine whether you need a special left turn treatment, 
you compare the amount turning left to the amount that you're opposing. Yeah. And when you look at those two numbers here, it doesn't even come close. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was okay. going to ask two questions. Is there somebody else? Because it has been an hour and a half. I do want to get to the public. But are there any more presenters? And is there big questions asked the traffic I person? just have one uh, observation. You have 27 exhibits in this 80 or 90 page document. The studies were done on um, weekdays and weekends. It looks like mornings, afternoons, and evenings over quite a lengthy period. Does it matter what type of the time of the year it is, spring, summer, fall, winter? We account for that by, by bumping the traffic up by, by a factor. We, 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 in this case, we put a 2% per year growth okay, to what's already there. So if there's fluctuation in, uh, in the time of year and all that, that that's pretty much accounted for accounted for. When it becomes problematic is if we do a summer count when there's in, 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 a, in a residential area where there's no school traffic, that seems to be a red flag. So there we've got to be cognizant that there's school and all that that needs to be treated and that the count was done in the summer. And then we specifically put an adjustment factor to account for that. But otherwise, the 2% growth rate we use per year seems to account for that. Um, I, I, w with regards to the utilization uh, by by virtue of the restaurant, is all of the traffic to be generated? Is that from the sit down restaurant business, and is there any takeout business that th that's proposed for the restaurant? And have you have you fa if if so, have you included the takeout portion in? Uh, making your calculations. We did not break it down by, you know, what constitutes the people who are going to be going in and out of the restaurant. We didn't account for that. We used the factors as they're in the document, and that includes everybody. It includes the employees coming to work. It includes the delivery trucks that deliver the food. It includes the patrons that come to either sit there or if they take out, to take out. Okay? Of course, if they're going to come there to take out, they're going to, or to sit down, they're either going to come there to sit down, okay, or they're going to come in and take out. They're generating a trip in and out, all right, irrespective of whether they st stay for the long haul or they're there to pick up their food and take it away, okay? Yeah. Just to add information, um, the Manchester restaurant is. Um, of a similar character, and I, I'm told that they do less than 2% of their business is a takeout business. They don't encourage it, and it's not what their what their goal is, is to have a takeout. So they don't even consider that to be a, any significant activity at all, and it isn't for them. All right, thank you. We have architecture. I know Mr. Yeah. Oikel is very interested in that, so <laughs> that's... Um, I don't know. That's well, the last. You've done their job. <coughs> they, they <laughs> believe me. <laughs> they were very, very aggressive. Um, the uh, the architecture uh, starts with the the double wall that that Kevin talked about in his presentation. Uh, this was done at the suggestion, urging of the historic district commission. <coughs> to break up the massing of uh, the wall that uh, will form the, the corner of this property. And it was a great suggestion. Um, so we have two lower walls with a landscaped three foot strip in between that will turn into a green space over time. And then at the top of the wall, the, there's an ornamental uh, fence to protect the outside dining area, which will be on the top uh, the deck that will be formed at the top of uh, the second rise of the wall. So it takes on a, a, a really nice uh, perspective from uh, Middletown Avenue and from the intersection of Maple Street and Middletown Avenue. The, the uh, Historic District Commission was given uh, several different choices of the colors of the building. They wanted uh, the architect to select the barn red. They felt that that was most in keeping with 
the concept of being in the Wethersfield Historic District. Uh, we accomplished that and provided them with, uh, in fact, we gave them four, I think, four red choices. The one you see is, is the one they selected as, as a barn red color. The wings of the building are, are white, um, metal paneled uh, building to create a, a difference in architecture and a facade. Kevin mentioned uh, the lighting treatment with uh, the same sort of uh, shape of lights that will uh, light the outside of the building to be not identical with, but consistent with and complementary to the lights we propose to put in the parking lot. Um, this is uh, the view on the Maple Street side. I do want to note that the signage is not presented to you for approval. It, uh, we expect to come back with a sign package separately um, once we have a final building um, that, that hopefully will be approved. Um, and, and again, as, as Kevin indicated, the wraparound double rising wall comes along Maple Street as well uh, until it tapers down to, to a much lower level. So again, that's going to be landscaped uh, in the same manner as uh, the, the part that faces Middletown Avenue. This is the west elevation, the elevation that, that faces the parking lot. And um, the area on your left is the area that will conceal the dumpsters and, uh, and other mechanical uh, equipment that will be behind the uh, in an enclosure. This it is doesn't show that enclosure though. It does. Uh, that the, the gated area? The, the gate, there's a gate, the gate and a, and a oh, okay. the, the gate area. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, I think I do. Um, and Very good discussion, sir. Well, we don't, we, we don't want it to look badly either. It's part of the building. Especially on Maple Ave. Yeah. Right. It's, it, we want it to not be, we want it to basically be invisible. That's our plan. This is the main entrance to the building. It would face to the south towards the parking lot. Uh, landscaped, and again, the, the barn red, the, uh, we have uh, gray metal awnings over the windows, and uh, the lighting is downlit, uh, full cutoff, dark sky compliant lights uh, used throughout the site. This is the interior uh, of the restaurant. Just for your interest, this is how we establish the seat counts and <coughs> identify the areas that uh, will end up um, being utilized for the various activities. Full dining seating. There is uh, significant dining within the bar area on, at tables and chairs, uh, as well as uh, different service areas provided. We pr tried to provide you with uh, some perspectives because we think it's uh, easier to appreciate the location of the building and how it sits on the site. Uh, if you can see a perspective like this, Mr. Dining, the architect, uh, helped prepare these. And um, as you can see, the building in the, in the lower uh, northeast corner of the property as it relates to the street as it relates to the judicial building um, and it's directly across from the Great <coughs> Preserve property. This would be the view uh, <coughs> from Middletown Avenue. Uh, we can't give you a street view because if the trees are all shown, you can't uh, get a view, a real view of the building. But it fits proportionally, we think, with uh, the siting of the building in the corner doesn't overwhelm the corner. It's relatively small, 6,000 square feet in total. And uh, sits in a location on the site that separates it from the warehouse and, and office facility, but gives people access to it uh, from the proposed parking lots. <coughs> um, this is the perspective that you would have if you were across the street. You can see the double tiered wall, the outside patio, the window treatments and the presentation of the building uh, from Middletown Avenue. I think that 
Mr. Diamond did a, a, did a great job in creating a book that carries some elements of, of not only the barn, the backward barn feel, but also some modern elements that tie it back to the judicial building to the right with its flat roof and sort of 19, I don't know, 80, 75 architecture. And then the, the upgrading of the warehouse. So he's tried to tie all those elements together. This is what you would see if you were coming into the intersection of Maple Street and Milltown Avenue at the light and getting ready to make uh, that left-hand turn <laughs> into uh, Middletown Avenue. And, and this gives you, I think, the best perspective of the manner in which the double-tiered wall really reduces the scale of the, of the building and its development on the corner. Kevin had mentioned that we wanted to have pedestrian access from the public sidewalk that runs along Middletown Avenue. You'll see the staircase at the end of the patio. And just to remind everybody, we also have a handicapped accessible sidewalk that rises up from Middletown Avenue and further back at the driveway so that the facility is fully handicapped accessible, whether you're arriving uh, along the sidewalk or by car, uh, it's going to be fully compliant and accessible. This would be the view coming down, heading east towards Glastonbury. Um, to the building. Our building is on the right. The official <coughs> building is, is set on the left. There is a full sidewalk uh, on the judicial side of, the, of Maple Street so that uh, you can use a signalized uh, intersection at Maple and Middletown to get to that sidewalk if you want it to come and go from the Silas Street Highway to the restaurant as a pedestrian. And then again, this is a perspective uh, looking at the property uh, as developed from the, this is a great narrow conservation area. Uh, looking across Middletown Avenue, looking up towards the Silas Street Highway, the profile of the building, we think, is, is really suitable. It's not overwhelming the site, and uh, we're, we're very pleased with the changes that the Historic District Commission recommended in terms of uh, the color of the building and, and the general configuration of the walls uh, that are uh, to be developed on the site. This is uh, just a repeat of the other uh, perspectives the building, all of which met with um, the approval of the uh, Historic District Commission um, after several meetings and a lot of discussion. They felt that they had achieved what they wanted to in terms of um, creating an architecture that was appropriate for the Historic District Commission and appropriate for that corner. And um, they felt at least it's my impression, uh, hesitant to speak for any commission, but uh, they embraced the idea that the building would be up on the street as part of the streetscape as opposed to set back with typical shopping center parking in front. Um, I don't know what would be most helpful, Mr. Chairman. Would you want the site plan up or do you want to? For the conversations? For yeah. Probably the site plan, the one that had a little color to it. Seven. <coughs> Seven? Thank you. <coughs> but is anybody on the commission opposed to moving this to the uh, public? Anything burning in your mind to talk? Ask I just have one kind of. Go ahead, please. Just generally, how will the existing restaurant warehouse use, you know, with the loading docks and the retail and the wholesale and so forth there, how will that, in terms of timing and potential traffic and pedestrian conflicts and that kind of thing, I mean, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the parking and the, and the layout is driven by the fact that this is going to continue to be the restaurant warehouse in the back. You know, are there going to be overlapping hours or, or how basically is it going to work so that both things can happen on the property during the same time?
based on my experience in Manchester, the, the, the business uh, of the restaurant during the day to the lunch hour is about 25% only of its business. The rest is done after 5 o'clock. The warehouse has most of its activity in the morning, and it's closed by 5 o'clock, and it's, it, it doesn't have business after 5 o'clock. Okay. So there's the, the, the most intense time for the restaurant is at a time when the warehouse office is, is closed. That's what I assumed the case would be, but I wanted yep. to hear it, and I, yep. I just also wanted to be sure that, you know, the time when deliveries were going to be made to the warehouse weren't going to be conflicting with... I mean, they, they, those mostly come in the morning. They, sometimes you can't control when yeah. a delivery comes, but principally it's in the morning, and they're certainly all come and gone before 5 o'clock in the afternoon because the warehouse is closed. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So uh, at this point, we're going to turn it over to the public, and I will ask you to just kind of raise a hand um, if, if it need be. We will start a line, but raise your hand, and if you've got something to express, please come join us at the mic. You guys start making yourself around. never done this so so bear with me so start by introducing yes. yourself and um, my name is Nancy Downey now I live on Prospect Street I'm here because my daughter and her family live at 195 Middletown Ave so I'm kind of her proxy she couldn't make it tonight um, first I'd like to make a comment that as a resident I think I feel I did follow the previous meetings about getting the um, variance to take the houses down and because of the loading dock I feel I was a little deceived because I think this was in the plan all along and I would have preferred if the whole plan and discussion was presented at the same time. I feel like we were led to believe that it was just going to be a restaurant loading dock and that's why they wanted the houses, but it sounds like this was always in the plan. So I feel a little deceived and that's just a comment from me as a resident. Um, I did have some of the traffic concerns that were voiced earlier about coming from the Putnam Bridge, turning left. I come over Route 3 in the morning and at night and midday, and the traffic can be bad, and taking a left there it can be bad, um, difficult. Um, so I have that concern, just like it was addressed earlier. Um, there is a entrance from the sidewalk on Middletown Ave, and I don't know who to address this to, Will there be signs posted that there, you can't park on Middletown Ave? Keep in mind, if the parking lot gets full or if people park there and go up those stairs from the sidewalk and try to park on Middletown Ave, I think that's something that needs to be addressed. Okay? Thank you. Um, the patio. Um, I'm not sure if the landscaping will discourage some of the noise. If you've ever been down in that area of Weathersfield, it's pretty flat. The noise does carry. My daughter's family is like four houses down. In the summertime, I mean, it's all flat through their backyard. The noise will probably flow from there. So I am a little concerned as to whether the landscaping will alleviate some of the noise from the patio. And basically, those are my Th concerns. Thank you. Um, I just so that other people might not know either. We're going to take your comments, and then we'll let them come back up and try and address some of these concerns that you raise, okay, rather than answering yep. every time? No right. problem. Thank, yep. thank you very much for participating. Gentleman in the back, I believe, was either way. Come on up. Yeah. Good evening, my name is Larry Brown. Uh, we've been up here before and we made a number of the uh, historic district meetings. Um, I have a very brief, well, my wife and I, we live at 188 Middletown Avenue, which is very close, if you recall. Um, and we steadfastly opposed the project, but we recognize progress is a juggernaut. So it's coming, we get it. Uh, we have some concerns though, like a lot of the other people that do live on that street. I'll throw them out to you. Um, I, 
I have to read, if I can, a very quick letter from the Cranes who couldn't be here. And I'll blow right through this letter for you, if I, if I can. If that's part yes, of it all. Yes, sure. Okay. We are Bruce and Pat and Barbara Crane. We live at 180 Middleton Avenue, diagonally across the road from the proposed building. We're opposed to this project in its entirety. However, we realize that based upon all the previous meetings where we and many others have spoken against the project without any concessions in our favor, will most likely be denied again. We hope uh, significant attention will be paid toward the noise suppression location of outdoor facilities, including sources of odors and dumpsters, and the design, design of the building with its tall walls, an outdoor dining location, make it very imposing in Middleton Avenue. Um, and that's the gist of it. Shall I speak? as proper suggest that. Sure, thank you, yes, we'll put it in the record. Okay, um, I'll be very brief. Um, to remind you, and these are the things that we learned from going to the HDC meetings, that the eight foot wall is there for a reason. It doesn't have to be there. Um, Mr. Alter says it does present the gateway, and it sure does, um, but it's elevated eight feet because there's I think federal guidelines, they have to be above that floodplain with the way they built that building. But they didn't have to put it eight feet up. It could have been road level and wrapped, but that would have been more expensive. So they wanted the less expensive, more gaudy building with the eight foot wall. And I believe that's the facts of the matter. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Number two. Um, we've been to the, the restaurant in Manchester, and it's, it's good. The food's very good. <laughs> I'll give you that. You got a great business there. And we fully expect this to be a tremendous success. Um, uh, there are some things. The, um, the patio with the 24 seating outside, that faces Middletown Avenue. That's eight feet above the street. Um, we expect there's going to be live entertainment. There's trivia contests at the other places. And that's okay, that's all part of the show. That's part of the business. But what will also generate noise? Will noise be coming out from the uh, building through the patio out into the neighborhood? Which is one of the main differences from Manchester. That's not in a neighborhood. This is our neighborhood and there's houses around. And people do do takeout, right? Uh, we do it, whether it's on the border, you got Uber Eats, You've got a lot of coming and going traffic, short-term traffic, and I don't think that's been addressed either. Um, the parking lot, 140 spots plus, give or take. Um, does that include the employees? We don't know. Um, short-term parking for pickup. I, I don't think that was addressed. Maybe you have and I wasn't paying attention. Um, we know it's coming. and. Uh, we're just asking in the future as this thing unfolds if you could help protect our, our neighborhood and, and our residents and our kids and our school buses, whether it's through uh, traffic calming devices, uh, protracted speed enforcement. I know the, the police department has been a great partner with the truck traffic. If we can get the, the no truck through traffic signs up if they're uh, not already back up, um, things of that nature. Uh, we see that the Entrance on Middletown Avenue has those steps. Well, and we do encourage getting taxis or Ubers if you're intoxicated. Um, is there a designated pickup area and drop-off area? I know some restaurants do have that, and it's a really good idea. I haven't seen that on these plans. Um, the reflection of the lights, the headlights in the building, and the, and the metal siding, that's another consideration of ours. Also, um, the lighting in the parking lot, we brought this up before. Um, those trees will take probably a dozen years before they fully do their job, if not longer. Um, and, and Mr. Alt had mentioned that the HDC really did embrace a lot of the things that they had designed, which is true, but that was with the limitations of their purview. They did refer a lot of these things that we brought up in those meetings to you guys in zoning. So um, that's really all I have. Again, thank you very much for your time. Um, it's coming. We get it. But if you could just help us protect our neighborhood and um, we can work together on this and 
and get through it. So, thank, thank you for your time. Thank you. Sure, and um, maybe if you could start, I'm seeing a few hands pop up. Maybe you can start a line behind them, sort of stuff, and so we can keep it going. Thank you. My name is Bob Woodward. I live at 456 Middletown Avenue, and we have lived there for a little over 40 years. A year and a half ago, we had dozens of people in here when you debated changing the zoning from, from residential to business. And you changed it saying that you could control it better. I'm going to hold you to that tonight. You have control of this. Your job is not to harm our neighborhood any further. We were harmed when the two houses were allowed to come down. We will be harmed if this project goes any further. You have put yourselves on the line and said, we can control this better if we change the zoning. And on behalf of the neighborhood, I'm definitely going to hold you to that. Um, we, we don't need this restaurant there. We have lived peacefully with the warehouse. It's been there since the 1950s, I'm told. And we've never had an issue with the warehouse, never had an issue with this property. Some people at uh, Historic District got up and said, well, you shouldn't live in a neighborhood where there's a, where there's a commercial place. Well, we've lived peacefully with that. It's this, and I realize things do change. But we are our neighborhood, and we are a residential neighborhood. Somebody mentioned traffic parking on the street, and it does happen. I came down there at night not so long ago, and there was a car in front of one house. Somebody coming out of this restaurant with too much to drink may be headed for an accident. I don't know. But the warehouse is fine, but we'd like the restaurant to go somewhere Mr. Gillespie knows there's lots of places in town that are open and looking for a tenant, and they're already business-owned, other than on the corner of our street. We don't need a liquor license, um, and there is one inaccuracy on that application. The nearest church is not Corpus Christi. There are one of two that are closer, either Center Point, which is just north of uh, City Fish, or the one on Elm Street across the meadows. And you'll have to figure out the distances to those two. I don't know, but they are both closer than Corpus Christi. But we don't need a liquor license on a residential street. And if you do go through with this, I would ask that you consider a no right-hand turn for any traffic onto Middletown Avenue. We don't need to increase the traffic into a residential neighborhood, please. That would be very important to us. And. Uh, if you do go ahead with this, we need, I would like to see the traffic. The traffic study was full of interesting statistics and information, but I would like to see that traffic study submitted to our local police and see if they have anything to add to it. They would know how many calls they get to what is a busy stretch of road and a busy intersection. I was lucky enough the other day to turn left out of the rear parking lot at City Fish. I didn't think I could, but I said, well, I'll take a look and see if I can get a break, and I did, but that all, it doesn't always happen. It's, it's safer to take right-hand turns on that street. Take care of our neighborhood. It is not the job of local government to harm a neighborhood. It is the job of local government to work with neighborhoods. We have been a long-time ne residential neighborhood down there, and we would like to think that we are of value to the town of Wethersfield, and you're not looking to further harm our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Woodward. Hi, good evening. My name is Christine Jacomy, 417 Middletown Avenue. I am still hoping that this entire project will be rejected. A person's home should be their sanctuary, a place to feel safe, comfortable, and at peace from the stressors of work, traffic, and other issues from the outside world. 
We choose to live in Wethersfield and take pride in our homes and neighborhoods. Wethersfield is a nice community which has provided its residents with that safety, comfort, and peacefulness. As homeowners of this town, we pay high taxes, as Wethersfield's mill rate is at one of the highest levels in the state. For a year now, residents of Middletown Avenue and its surrounding area have appeared before town hall meetings, voicing their concerns and opposition to the building of the proposed burger restaurant and bar at the corner of Middletown Avenue and Maple Street. Countless hours have been spent not only at these meetings, but in preparation for these meetings and stressing over what this proposed business will do to our neighborhood. Despite overwhelming opposition to the proposed business at this location, all of Joseph Sulo's requests have been granted. At some of these meetings, the residents of our neighborhoods have been ridiculed and berated by Sulo's buddies, none of whom are residents of the affected neighborhood and thus rightly should have had little to say on the matter. The fear of the residents of Middletown Avenue is that once this business is built, the safety, peace, and sanctity of our homes and neighborhood will be forever changed. This business will bring more traffic and noise to the area, as well as perhaps crime and criminal mischief. This is a residential, family-oriented street, and we are already dealing with too much traffic. We ask that you not permit this project from going forward. Base your decision on how this will affect the town and the residents of the street. Traffic along Maple Street is already horrible, and this business at the proposed site will create much more congestion to that area. Any economic gains that the town hopes will get from this project may very well backfire because of the added traffic it will create, likely causing out-of-towners to completely avoid coming to Wethersfield for shopping or dining, or to consider opening new businesses, knowing the choking traffic at one of the main access routes into town. We entrust town officials to act fairly on behalf of all residents and all town neighborhoods. Committee members, I encourage you to seriously talk to Mr. Sulo, encourage use of one of the many available, more suitable prime commercial sites in town. Why can't this result in a win-win situation for all? His property is just too small for his, for his existing warehouse and this new proposed business. His property is not the best suited location for such a business. If Mr. Sulo really looked at all of this objectively, I honestly believe he would agree that this is not the best location for his new business. Bottom line is that I am very much opposed to this project at this location. I am opposed to the eight foot wall that has been planned. I am opposed to the heavy traffic that will result both on Maple Street and Middletown Avenue as a result of this new business. As we heard today from the traffic study, 62 to 80 cars per hour are expected. That is a lot. Irregardless of the positive view that the traffic manager has, this will create a lot more traffic to our area. Gone will be the days that people will enjoy walking, jogging, and bike riding in this area of town. Mr. Hammer, I fully agree with your comment about a car traveling west waiting to turn left into the lot. I believe we will see a lot more accidents in the area. Thank you for the opportunity to voice my concerns, and please, as you vote, seriously think about how your decision will impact our town and our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Joe Fazio. I live at 6 Pebble Road in Wethersfield. I've been here for 28 years. I love Wethersfield. I never saw myself settling here, but I'm happy I did. I like old Wethersfield. I like the combination of community and business, restaurants, that type of thing. I think what this proposes is more of the same idea of old Wethersfield. Traffic issues can definitely be dealt with. I think that it's a good thing for the town. I think we need more of this. I would love to see this come to Wethersfield myself. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Beth Riley. Uh, I live on Hubbard Place in Wethersfield. Um, Wethersfield's in desperate need of some economic growth, uh, specifically restaurants. Um, when my friends and family want to go out to a restaurant, we typically go to West Hartford or Glastonbury, um, some of the restaurants owned by the Doro Restaurant Group. Um, it's a great restaurant group. Um, the restaurants are phenomenal. Uh, they're tried and true. They, um, the restaurant would bring jobs and much more to the area. Um, uh, I, think they're, I think the restaurant has done their homework and due diligence for over two years uh, with this property. I urge uh, the planning and zoning to approve this tonight. 
um, in regards to the restaurants on Middletown Ave, perhaps some of the, some of the suggestions can be taken into consideration. Um, the no right-hand turn from the parking lot sounds like a, a reasonable expectation. And I'm assuming there's some type of no noise ordinance in Weathersfield. I don't know anything about that that can hopefully be enforced. Uh, my only request coming tonight was that there was a bike rack, and I'm happy that it's there. Um, anyway, wish you guys the best. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas Doramo, 43 Bob White Hill, Weathersfield. Um, I don't live on your street, and I, I get your concerns. I live on the other side of town, but um, I do take offense to being Joe Sulo's buddies. Um, we never harassed anybody in town at all, um, and uh, I think they do a great job. And I do have a, I have a say in this town. I live in this town. I pay taxes in this town. I'm very much involved in this town. I'm on the Mikey's Place board. I'm on the Keene Foundation board. I'm on Unico board. I give back to my community. I care about our community. I think it's a good thing. I understand the concerns. I think they really did a great job, Joe Sulo and his team, of answering those concerns. So I am in full support of this project, and that's my feelings. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony Gochi, 321 Middletown Avenue. Can I ask one question? Mr. Gillespie, is the traffic report the same one I looked at in your office? I believe it is. Okay. Um, so. so it's the one that does not have a traffic counter put on it? Uh, you heard the presentation. I'll let them it's explain just the how they did the counts. It's just a recording from what he said, yes. which was done, if I understood him correctly, in March of 2019. Middletown Avenue was closed, was not open to through traffic. So it's not an accurate read of the traffic on Middletown Avenue at all. If you gentlemen have traveled the area when there's an accident on I-91, Middletown Avenue is the main cut through to Rocky Hill. Everybody under the sun uses that road. We have trouble getting out of our driveways, okay? It really needs to be done with a counter, not with a recording. What has the state said about making this left-hand turn coming out of Glastonbury across three lanes of traffic, not two, and a double yellow line? You're not supposed to go over a double yellow line. That's state law. Go read the traffic manuals. All right. The, the last meeting I came to, you changed the variance of the properties because they said they needed it for the truck docks. But if you look at the layout here, it has nothing to do with the truck docks. It's all about this. Because they're utilizing the area where they said the trucks were going to be turning around for parking. It's not the same. It's totally not the same. If you go back to your last meeting that you addressed this when you changed the zoning for those two houses, okay, to business, their excuse was they needed that property to make turns with the trucks. As far as, and you also were supposed to make sure no trucks came down Middletown Avenue. The trucks are turning right out of their driveway and going down Middletown Avenue, okay? There are also parking trucks over there overnight. J.B. Hunt trucks, Amazon trucks are parking where this restaurant is going to go. I don't know why they've been parking. I brought it to Mr. Gillespie's attention in regards to that. They seem to do whatever they want to do. The trees out in front, they cut all the lower branches when they weren't supposed to. That was all put there for aesthetics to keep the, the building hidden. They wanted to open it up. Now they want to open it up all more. So another question I'm going to ask is, because they didn't show it on the plan, where are they going to put the grease trap for this building? They're going to need a 1,000-gallon grease trap for this building. The sewer on Route 3 is right next to the curb line. If they're only 20 feet away, 25 feet away, they're not going to have a proper pitch. I deal with sewers all the time, I know what I'm talking about here, all right? You need a 1,000-gallon grease trap according to MDC rules for a restaurant. This is something that you gentlemen really should either table it and make them put a counter in and check the counts of these traffics, check with the state about crossing three lanes of traffic to turn left in that driveway because 
he made a very good point, Mr. Handler. Car's coming up the road at 60 miles an hour, and all of a sudden somebody decides, oh, there's the restaurant. I got to turn right there. They're going to stop. They're, you're going to have a ton of accidents there. I'm going to tell you that right now. Even if you're using your GPS, how many of you use the GPS when it's telling you to turn into a building? Think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Guy Tomasi. I'm at 174 Middletown Avenue, which is directly across the street. It's really easy for everybody here and everybody here who doesn't live on Middletown Avenue to be in favor of this. I get it. It's economic development. Wethersfield needs an infusion of money. We pay dearly for taxes. Yeah, I, yeah, I live in Wethersfield. People who've talked here tonight live in Wethersfield. We support this. Yeah, but that but do, that's great. You don't live on Wethersfield Avenue. It's easy. It's very easy to sit there and anybody here who lives in Wethersfield and says, yeah, I'm for it. It's a great thing. I think it's a great thing too. But let's not lose fact that the site is, it's easy to make a decision when you're not impacted. And we on Middletown Avenue are impacted. I know this is gonna go through. I'm not stupid, okay? We hope you make concessions. We hope you think of us. But let's not say, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, this is a great thing. It is, all right, I'll give you the nod. But unless you live on Middletown Avenue, we're the ones who are going to experience this, whether it's two extra cars or 100 extra cars, whether it's lights coming out of the parking lot into my front yard. We're the ones who are going to have to live through that and everybody else on Middletown Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Steve Belinda, 141 Fox Hill Road. Um, I read today a great article in the Hartford Business Journal about the artisanal burger company coming here, and that's exciting. I see Puritan Furniture Warehouse coming down. I see the apartment buildings going up. There's a lot of buzz going on in Connecticut or in Wethersfield right now that makes me excited to live in Wethersfield again. Now, uh, I don't begrudge anyone here who wants to come and say negative things about uh, the building that's going up. I get that. They have that right to speak their mind, but I also have the right to be heard too. Um, what I'm hearing tonight from a majority of people are emotions, deceived, harmed, uh, ridiculed, berated. You can't make decisions based on emotions though. Emotions cloud judgment. They, cl they cloud logical thinking. Joe Sulu will invest a lot of money to uh, get his people up here to rebut every argument that has been made so far as far as what it takes to work harmoniously with this um, neighborhood to work with the people. He's an established businessman that's been investing in this town for many years. His only sin is that he bought a piece of commercial property and he wants to put a building on it. That's what his sin is. Who are we to tell him that he can't do that? You guys are charged with the responsibility bestowed upon you by us, the residents, to make legitimate <coughs> business reasons on people uh, building their business in um, a plot that they bought. That's it. We shouldn't be thinking about emotions and people coming in here, coming to you, weaponizing this commission to extract their wrath on Joe Sulu, who did nothing wrong. I've heard it at the Historic Commission. I'm hearing it tonight. Enough. Let Joe build his building. He's been responsible. He's established. He's been doing this for years. He's not somebody that fly by night, come out of nowhere, uh, wham, bam, build the building and gone. He's committed to this community. I've seen it time and time again. I work in the public sector. I work in East Hartford for eight years. I've been in Enfield for eight and a half years. Councils, uh, mayors, they would be pushing a peanut with their nose down solid and higher to get people like Joe Sulu to come invest in their community. That's what Cabela's would give him a seven-year tax abatement to come here. Here we have a guy who's willing to invest his money in a, in a parking lot to enhance the beauty. That's a beautiful building. Who wouldn't want that building there? And yet we're doing everything we can to make obstructions, obstacles, uh, delays, he has to keep investing more and more money. How much does he have to keep investing? Enough. 
He's been doing everything he's done, and he's been responsible. He's in committed. He's done it with his pocketbook. He's done it with his time. Look at this team of people here. They're not here on volunteers. He's paying for them. And, and we should be thankful that we have people that want to invest in our community because that enhances all of our investments. Our largest investment is our house for most people in this town. And when people want to come and live in your community, invest in your community, that enhances the rising tide raises everyone's investment. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't see anybody moving toward the mic. So Brian Malinke, 222 Middletown Avenue. Um, Sadly, I have a letter that I'd uh, like to read from the Tacy's, if I can do so. They weren't able to make it, they're traveling at the moment. So this is from Ron and Judy Tacy, 212 Middletown Avenue, and bear with me, it's, it's long. <clears throat> so we speak against this proposal, here we are again in the winter and the holiday time, perfect timing to stuff this proposal through. This proposal is a great example of economic development at any cost. We are sure this neighborhood will see uh, the dramatic drop in our taxes as a result of this unwanted and unneeded development. We will sum up the message the Town of Wethersfield commissions have sent to our neighborhood through their actions on this property over the past two years. We speak for 125 uh, petition uh, petitioners of our Middletown Avenue neighborhood. The Middletown Avenue neighborhood homes are expandable. Zoning has signaled any ch uh, zone change is reality. And three, our neighborhood does not matter to the Zoning Commission, Historic District, or this town. We are watching economic development at any cost. <clears throat> our neighborhood should be considered. One, the design crams too much building in the space, and that requires an eight-foot raised wall. Seven and a half, apparently, for an eight-foot wall. This commission's job is not set to save the owner money by using the imposing retaining wall on Middletown Avenue as a solution to the floodplain. The fact that the floodplain is there is not news, and perhaps this is why nothing else has been built there. The building should be wrapped as described by the owner's architect at a previous meeting, as this will eliminate the necessity for an eight-foot wall. It will be more, more costly, but the owner has demonstrated no lack of funds. Why should this neighborhood pay the price? of looking at an eight-foot wall on the corner, raising the proposed restaurant on a dominating pen, uh, pedestal. Even with the HDC stipulation for, planting, for a planting setback halfway up the wall, it will still be what it is, a giant welcome to Wethersfield eyesore. Two, a sidewalk on Maple Street should be built. Someday the sidewalk to the Silas theme may be finished, and this is perfect timing. We see people walking there often. <coughs> Three, the proposal faces Middletown Avenue, not Maple Street. Therefore, it seems that the main entrance is on Middletown Avenue. The entrance exit should curve so, uh, so as not to send all the traffic down Middletown Avenue. The current no right turn out of the parking lot should be maintained and actually enforced. Design it so you can turn right onto Middletown Avenue. We see trailer trucks daily leaving the restaurant supply warehouse and head south on Middletown Avenue to avoid the Silas Dean. Four, safety concerns abound. The current design requires pedestrians to cross the truck traffic of a shared parking lot. This plan is an accident waiting to happen. Five, an independent traffic impact study is a must. Every, day, every delay on I-91 or the Silasdine Highway sends a bumper-to-bumper -bumper parade down our street that can last for hours. This town has demonstrated its inability to enforce its own stipulations. The judicial parking lots across the street from 24 Maple Street are prime examples of what happens. We were told you would not see the parking lots in a few years. Can you see those lots? We have looked at the original plans for the realignment of this intersection. They remind us very much of what is being proposed for 24 Maple Street. They are only empty promises on paper to gain permission to build. The town apparently has no means or will to enforce. The, this past or the past November election results should be sending a loud message from Wethersfield residents about what they thought of the super majorities on our town council and various commissions that like to lump their decisions for the greater good rather than the rather than, well, it says rather than he, respecting the concerns of the neighbor, neighbors affected. Our Middletown Avenue neighbors have lost all respect for the Historic District Commission. We are forced to comply with their infinite uh, minutia to make simple improvements to, our, to your homes, and yet suddenly some homes, are, some homes just aren't important anymore and can be torn down. For what, a parking landscape and drainage pond? 
This zoning commission ignored the message sent by our neighborhood that we didn't want this development on the corner of one of the busiest intersections in town. It belongs on the Silas Dean or the Burlington Turnpike. Just look at all the available properties currently available. Why put this business here and impact our neighborhood rather than putting it in an existing location much better suited for it? We are asking this commission that if you can't see your way to reject this plan entirely, please approve a plan that benefits our neighborhood. Shouldn't we be considered as well? So far, there are no changes made or proposed at 24 Maple Street that will benefit our neighborhood. And it's initialed by the Tacy's. So, thank you. So, from my point of view, I'd ask that you reject the application. Um, w w not so much because I don't like his restaurant. I think he did a fine job in, with his plans and everything else. I agree with, to some agree what Mr. Belinda said, you know, the town can definitely use a nice restaurant. I just don't think this is the proper location for it. I think it should be on the Silenstein Highway or the Burlington Turnpike, which is where the bulk of the commercial traffic and commercial properties are. Um, if you can't reject this application, then I ask that you can try to help the neighborhood by keeping the traffic um, flowing to the left out toward Route 3 and not back down Middletown Avenue. That's just going to increase the traffic more and create safety issues. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Lewis, 104 Morgan Circle, Weathersfield. Uh, I've been here for 59 years, and I hear everybody always complaining about our mill rate and our tax rate, and yet we always seem to find something wrong with everything we try to do to grow. Um, I think it's a great idea. I think it's a beautiful restaurant. I've been to their restaurant. It's fantastic food. I think it's going to be super for uh, families in town and getting some kids and people in town working locally. Um, so I'm, I'm all for it. I hope it goes through. Thank you. No other hands up at the moment. I'm sure we'll have another opportunity for you to join us then. Thank you. I think I saw you uh, taking notes. I certainly did. Took a few notes. Um, um, I worked my way back through the list if that's yeah, that'll okay be fine. with you. And if I miss something to comment, I'm happy to, to speak to that. Um, my understanding, uh, I'm starting from uh, the lady who spoke on behalf of her daughter, uh, who lives at 195 Middletown Avenue, she asked whether or not um, <coughs> it would be possible to put no parking signs on Middletown Avenue. That's a traffic authority issue. If it became an issue, then uh, I, agree, I agree. We'll you know we'll be talk to staff it. about that if this moves forward. Yep. The. Um, the outdoor dining obviously will occur in, in, in good weather. Um, I can maybe speak to a couple of things. Uh, I live in the village in South Glastonbury, about 150 feet from Two Hopewell, which has an outdoor patio. And um, the one with I the car in it? Yeah, does it still have a car? The car, <laughs> is, the car has been removed. Um, and uh, I, I can say that. Um, First of all, there, there isn't going to be any outdoor entertainment on the patio. There isn't? There okay. is not. And uh, so that you have the normal conversational noise of, of people having dinner. Um, the restaurant isn't open at 4 o'clock in the morning. It's not open early in the morning. It's not open at times that, that would cause a disturbance to people. So, uh, and... I learned from experience in another application in this town that you do have a, a noise ordinance that uh, you pretty strictly enforce. I think Mr. Oiko instructed me in that one time. Um, so, so as long as you're on it, we didn't get into a lot of the details because we wanted to get into the public. We were trying to stay high, but as long as you're on it, what are the hours of operation? Hours of operation are 11.30, which is uh, when the lunch hour starts, so mm -hmm. employees would arrive before mm -hmm. that. Um, during the week, it's 11 o'clock at night is closing. On weekends, Friday and Saturday night, it's typically later, 12 o'clock or thereafter. But um, the, uh, and I talked to Mr. Sulo and his partners about this. Um, this is not a bar serving food. This is a full service restaurant that has alcoholic beverages as part of its menu. Their, their focus is on food service. Um, if you've been to Manchester, 
uh, you would see that. If you've gone to any of the other restaurants, uh, you would know that. And, and so it's an important distinction, at least to me, um, that, uh, that um, those hours are really restaurant hours, not uh, what would somebody would consider a bar uh, operation. The, um, <coughs> Mr. Brown um, read the letter from uh, Mr. and Mrs. Crane. They asked where the dumpster is. The dumpster is in the enclosure in the very uh, northwest <coughs> corner of the building. Uh, along Maple Street, as far away from the residential uses as it can be. Uh, it needs to be accessible for pickup. That's within the enclosure that I pointed to uh, when Mr. Oik asked that question. Uh, so the dumpster location is, is situated uh, far away and screened by the entire building from Middletown Avenue. We cannot develop this site and, and lower the building. If we lower the building, the grades of the parking lot will be impossible. We're already in a, in a grade that is acceptable but not totally desirable. A parking lot typically, uh, people look for a 2, 3, 4 percent grade. We're able to achieve a 5 percent grade by the grading that Kevin described earlier. Um, if the building were lowered, the entire parking lot would be much more steep than it is now, and, and that represents not only a safety issue, but a, an inconvenience issue for anybody who might want to participate a, as a patron at the restaurant. Um, we also had a little portion of the flood zone is in that corner between Maple Street, uh, Maple, at, I'm sorry, Middletown Avenue and Maple Street, um, and, and we had to accommodate the the requirements of, of no incremental filling within the flood zone, which is what uh, the approval we got from uh, the Wetlands Commission. Lighting uh, was raised as well. Uh, I'll say it again at the risk of repeating myself. Every, uh, every fixture that we have is both full cutoff and dark sky compliant. And you have a lighting analysis done by uh, our lighting contractor, which shows that there's no wash off of the site. Um, and as uh, Mr. Johnson reported, I just want to confirm, it's my understanding, and Mr. Gillespie can certainly correct me if I'm wrong, that you worked with Mr. Stulo to change out the lights on the building so that they were full cut off dark sky compliant fixtures, and that that change has been done. Just to refresh everyone's memory, at one of the previous hearings, we did receive complaints from the neighbors about lights that had been installed on the building. Uh, subsequent to that, I did go out to the property at nighttime with Mr. Sulo, and uh, the fixtures were all changed to become fully uh, dark sky compliant. So um, that is correct. Thank you. Um, I stand corrected on the distance to a religious facility. The Jehovah's Witness facility is on Elm Street. I forgot about that. So if you go down to the light right before you go across the bridge and take a right on Elm Street, there's a Jehovah's Witness facility down there, which is clearly closer. It's probably 1,000 feet from where we are instead of the 3,900 feet that Corpus Christi is. Um, and I apologize, I don't know what center point is, but that would be if it's beyond. Center point is no longer uh, occupying the building. The sign is still up, but they, they vacated the premises, so. Um, And I mean no disrespect to the people who live on Middletown Avenue. I've been doing this a long time, and I know that people in neighborhoods are feel affected and, and impacted when people propose development. But having a, a fear or an apprehension of something that of, of which there is no evidence is not a basis for a zoning commission to make a decision. The law is pretty clear on that. Fears or unrealized fears or expressions of concern like um, 
Mr. Woodward, do not harm our neighborhood. I don't know what the harm is. We're over 300 feet away from the nearest house. We're in a business park zone with this development. It's a permitted use in that zone by special permit. So it's hard to picture what that harm is uh, unless, um, well, I don't know what it is. I, I, I don't have an unless, I guess. Um, I appreciate it. It's not too often I go to hearings where actually have people speak in support of an application, so it's kind of a pleasant <laughs> change. Um, and we did have some people who spoke uh, in support of this application, recognizing that it provides jobs, it produces tax revenues, it provides a hospitality resource that this community could use, according to their testimony, so that all of those uh, matters are, are well worth your consideration. I am, Jim, could you just come up and, and speak to the, the issue of when you took the traffic counts and... Um, when we took the traffic count in March, there was nothing shut down on Middletown Avenue at the, at the Maple Street end. What was going on at the other end, I don't know, but the count did show volume coming through. When we did the study and then it got submitted, and your town planner said that we hadn't incorporated the board data. We went and we got the board data, and I found that the board's background data for Middletown Avenue were higher than what we had. So I thought, well, maybe something was closed. So I checked with the people who did the count, and they did the count with video, and that's another subject. And they said they did not know of any closing. But nevertheless, I took the higher counts and I reevaluated the study. And that was the second report I submitted. The update did not change the levels of service. Okay? And as far as doing the counts with video versus doing it with tubes, I mean, yeah. this is the new world. That's how they're done now. Right. So, so, uh, when I, when I heard that, I was concerned. It's your, <clears throat> what you're saying is that uh, you went back to the Borden studies and used their Middletown numbers, which would have been pre the work that was going on on the Middletown? Yeah, that was, that was a couple of years ago that they yeah. did their counts, and then they projected them forward to about where we are. Yep. And when I looked at them, I saw that they were, they weren't that much higher, but they were higher, okay? Yeah. And that happens, as you know, it happens. Somebody can go out there and count it today and then go out there next week and count it, and there'll be a difference between the two counts. So I said, just to be on the, on the, on, on the, on the, uh, on the conservative side, and also we do this all the time in this business, if somebody produces a count that's higher on a street, we always go with the higher count. So does the DOT. Hmm. If the DOT has a higher count when you submit something to them, they say, hey, use the higher count. And then we redo it and use the higher count. Well, that's what I did. I used the higher of the two sources of data, and I came up with the same results that the levels of service will be A, B, C, all right? Which is very good levels of service for what, for what we're talking about. You know, the, the one thing um, I was going to ask you when you were talking before, um, you described it as A, B, C. Did you, did you identify a difference when you put the numbers in, or was it? You know, A at this location, and it's A when the when you put the new numbers in, and at this location was C, and when you put the new numbers in, it was still C. So, in other words, it didn't change, or did it change? What changed was the amount of delay. As you know, the delay yep. has a range. Yep. Every delay has a range. It goes from here to here. It's an A. If it yep. goes from there to there, it's a B, and so forth. What it changed when we added something, and that's just natural. The delay went up. Per, per vehicle, the average delay, but it still kept it within the range of that level of service. So the level, the levels stayed the same. That's they true. stayed the same whether we added our traffic, the Borden traffic, or even the difference between the Borden's background traffic for Middletown Avenue and our, our count for Middletown Avenue. All right, thank you. Okay? And it's all in the it's all in the sources. So the gentleman that's asked if he can come and see the traffic studies, I assume the town planner has them. 
you'll look at the two studies and it's clear what's going on here. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, that same gentleman uh, asked about a, a grease trap location. If you look at the utility plan that's been submitted, it shows uh, the location of the grease trap in the service area. In the service, okay. It's not, I, I'd have to go to the utility plan, but you have it in your packets that I, that right. I have. It's sheet. That's, that's the nine. kitchen area up to the nine, the nine, west sheet side. Nine. Um, I, I certainly can't promise Mr. Tomasi that a headlight is never going to shine in his front yard. Um, but I think that the landscape plan that, that Kevin has designed does everything reasonably possible to create less intrusion than uh, one might expect. Uh, I, I'm, I have to say that I, I thought Kevin went to uh, pretty great lengths to create screening that will protect the neighbors from the wash of, of headlights. So, so could we just um, stay on that for a minute, right? Sure. So do you have a lot more on your list? Because actually, I've got about two more, but go ahead. Um, so, characterizing a few things, right? Uh, size of plantings seem to be a general thought uh, for the screening purposes. No right turn on to Middletown. Follow up after the opening if there are still some concerns. Um, the patio being high and noisy, and that goes to the screening. So, can we? talk a little bit about the screening and how specifically you're, you're screening the headlights from a parking lot and the noise from a patio. I know it's going to cover similar ground. Um, so again, for the record, Kevin Johnson. Um, so in that area of the detention pond, uh, the west side of that, uh, east side of the parking area, that's the area that has proposed Norway spruces to be planted at six to eight feet tall at time of planting. And it's about, they're, they're indicated to be about 15 feet on center. And again, Norway spruces, and I chose a Norway spruce because they have these big pendulous branches, um, so over time, they should grow together, um, you know, and provide, in my opinion, a very dense screen. If the commission wants me to tighten it up and do 10 feet on center, you know, I mean, we can do that. Um, so I think that area would be heavily protected and, and screened. Moving northerly, um, the parking, uh, Closer to the restaurant, that's, well, beginning by the service drive, there's a stretch where I've got, uh, I believe it's ink berries. They're going to grow three to four feet tall. Then you've got the sidewalk that comes in. On the east side of that sidewalk, I've continued that same treatment of shrubs. The same ink berries, same height, three to four feet. Uh, this is up on top? Mm -hmm. That's at the top. At, at the top on the, of the, on the, the, embankment, top of the embankment is right. where the ground cover treatment was. Now, certainly that's not going to do anything to screen right. headlights. It's going to be the evergreen shrubs. And that's continuous from basically that corner of the parking by the service drive all the way up to the end island by the main entrance. <coughs> and then, again, you've got street trees proposed. As they grow over time, and again, there's some smaller ornamental dogwood trees that are also proposed as an understory. Mm -hmm. So I think in combination with all that, and again, if, if the commission wants more trees added, be happy to add a few more. Or even drop in a couple evergreen conifers in that stretch. Thank you. Uh, 
with respect to to noise um, we don't anticipate that the patio is going to produce uh, it has 24 seats I'm telling you there's no outdoor entertainment so what you're going to have is 24 people talking to each other well 12 people talking at one time um, <laughs> you think maybe, <laughs> maybe not <laughs> um, and uh, and in that circumstance uh, as I said before um, directly across from that patio is the Great Meadow Trust property there's no house there the nearest house is about 377 feet from the edge of a corner of our building to the corner of their house. I, I don't think that that noise will be as perceptible as a car driving by, driving by with a bad muffler. That, that's my opinion uh, mm -hmm. with respect to noise. If I were sitting here telling you we're going to have a, a rock band playing, uh, we were going to do what... Uh, uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, we no. get a place in uh, <laughs> Old Weathersfield does, then that might be an issue, but we're not. Yeah. Um, that's that's not not in the plan. How about even even music? Is are there speakers are out there or anything like that? Like background music? There, there would be speakers, but if you say no music, then fine. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to, it, it was one of the details right. that we just didn't get to, what's going on out there. So, well, background music type stuff. Okay. The, uh, I think just to comply with the noise ordinance, it would have to be pretty much turned off because the property line is 12 feet away from it. Oh, okay. right at the property line. Especially at 10 after 10 o'clock? Yeah. So, yeah, then it drops down to like 50 wow. decibels after 10 o'clock, I want to say. Well, it depends on what that's the closing zone is, yeah. Right, and, and it, that's this level. That's 50 decibels. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, do you have any other questions? Mr. No, you've hit, you've hit my points. The, uh, I, I just want to, make one other comment or two other comments. You know, first of all, um, we believe that we've presented evidence to you tonight that indicates compliance with all of the requirements for a special permit. Uh, if anybody on the commission doesn't think we've done that, I would ask that while the public hearing is open, you tell me that so we can consider what your concern is. Um, I'm not going to walk my way through Section 8 of your regulations line by line. Um, I think there's enough evidence uh, within the record to support each and every one of the requirements of Section 8, um, although I'm happy to discuss any one of them if <coughs> one co a commissioner has a concern about that. I also want to point out that um, one of your other charges is to apply your regulations in a way that's consistent with uh, your plan of conservation and development. And uh, I would point to three policy statements in the plan of conservation and development. I found these on page 68 under business development. Number three was maximize utilization of business sites and zones and promote development and redevelopment of underutilized commercial properties. I think you have an application that does exactly that for you tonight. Number five was promote private redevelopment of sites. That's exactly what Mr. Sulo is presenting to you tonight is the private redevelopment of a site. We are not asking the town to assist us in that regard. Um, and finally, number six, Encourage consolidated development with shared access, parking, and circulation. And again, with a mixed-use site such as we have, uh, I think that Mr. Garrow and, and, and Mr. Diamond have put together a mixed-use development that takes advantage of the, a consolidated development, utilizing shared access, utilizing parking for both of these activities and creating a, a safe and appropriate traffic circulation. 
again all in conformance with the policies that you've set out in your plan of conservation and development for business development i don't think there's any evidence before you that we have not satisfied any element of the special permit requirements as i indicated fears and apprehensions are not evidence of anything i think mr sulo has demonstrated a willingness to cooperate the ease with which mr gillespie was able to resolve the light question on the existing warehouse building is an example of that 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 i think you can rely on uh... and we believe that uh... weathersfield including the middletown area will milltown avenue area will benefit from a development like this we're happy to answer any questions that you have thank you all right thank you george yeah uh... three things i know it's in my notes here uh... there was uh... comment toward you folks about the mechanical equipment on the roof does it need sealing could that be discussed by you or by peter i don't you know peter you want to elaborate on that so uh... the that equipment had not been shown on uh... previous plans so we uh, requested that at least the location be identified so that um, we had an opportunity to comment on that and I think Kevin responded that they removed one of the landscaped islands in order to uh, have a ground location for some of those uh, they may end up having some rooftop um, but I think if I'm looking at the architecture there's a parapet wall if you're looking at this uh, Look at right there this elevation there's a four foot parapet wall Mr. Oikel right. and that any, nope. any mechanicals would be set behind that behind that parapet okay so that settles that issue another one uh, it said uh, one of the things the site presently has a right turn restriction on Middletown Avenue driveway which is not included in this plan how do you feel about that issue uh, I don't feel very good about that issue um, I think that creating a restriction like that for passenger traffic for customers of the restaurant is is not necessary based on Mr. Bibaris's study that the, the element of traffic going from this restaurant and exiting to the right are, are going to be, be are, and there are people that live in that direction so um, are you going to tell them they all got to go around the block, go up to the Silasine Highway, and go down to Mill Street yeah, and come back down? Yeah. Now, um, I don't. I'm not aware of what the restriction was on trucks. Um, maybe Mr. Gillespie recalls. I don't. I'm not aware of that. It's from a previous prior, prior permit, and the sign was up until, or still may be up. I can't, I can't recall. It's there, but it's falling off. Yeah, so that's probably why it's it's uh, maybe being ignored as it was testified to. So. Uh, the comment was really only about the, the Truck. trucks because it carried back to a previous and issue. So. Certainly, if that was a, re a requirement so before, we'll put the sign back up and make sure that trucks don't turn right. But I would resist prohibiting patrons customers, patrons. No, that was not the intent. Being able to exit. Yeah. But w wasn't it part of the dialogue when we were talking about the warehouse, though? So, so <coughs> is, it, is it a requirement of the or original permit for the for the warehouse or even the, the permit we just gave it, go, it goes back of? to the um, candy I'm try, I, the name escapes me the New Britain candy New Britain company. candy um, so yeah because all we did was the zone change we right change it wasn't you it wasn't this group here. it mm -hmm. was either a previous mm -hmm. uh, decision by the ZBA or uh, the zoning or zoning commission maybe before that when it was originally I think it was the ZBA I, I think it happened at the same time as some of the um, uh, evergreen trees were required um, I, don't, I don't really know if there's any effective signing that would address trucks only not turning right and you know what I mean right so it's kind of a valid point but uh, you know Enforcement's going to be a nightmare. All you do is pass it on to the cops. Yeah, the only way is to modify the curb cuts to make it directional. Yeah. So that you can't have anybody turning right. 
Yeah, well, we can think about that anyways. And it's, um, uh, you, then you also can't have anybody turning left, coming well, north. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. And send them around a Maple Street to turn into the site, which makes no sense. Yeah. All right. Other? Yeah, one more. Yeah. I Yeah, I'm sorry. Very sorry on that. Uh, the town manager even told me to start speaking into the <laughs> mic for quite a while when he became town manager. I'm doing well, town look manager. What happened to him. <laughs> <laughs> that was the past yeah, town manager oh. that said that. You're right. <laughs> sorry, everybody. Um, the uh, Kevin, particularly, uh, you you've reduced the um, your plantings. From 11, what should be 11,000 to the way we're required, it's uh, 6,000 you're eliminating mm -hmm. out of that 11 to 4,800. And the reason for that is because all of the parking for the trucks. With the maneuvering area the maneuvering for the trucks all is all, is so all that included. Really makes it difficult to do anything. Can you do anything to improve that? <sighs> Not without inhibiting. Yeah, well, five extra spaces times 160 feet. That's. So you think you're covering the periphery and around the building enough with with this? Uh, it's not an issue, and it certainly so you can't put it up near the bu the uh, building, the big building. So, right. So George, can I jump on that question and just go? What about the peripheral? Landscaping. I mean, I understand. Uh, I, I think others on the committee probably understand, like I do, that it's difficult often to get the island numbers. Um, but there's other areas that you could, you know, add. And and can you speak a bit about the the plantings that you have around the periphery in terms of the what's minimal and what are you providing? Like, are you three times what you know we would expect on the perimeter? Well, again, like perimeter. I think it's tabulated on the site plans. Originally, I don't think it did, and staff asked us to include it. All, all the other requirements we meet, I mean, th one of the main requirements is one tree for every 50 linear feet. I, I don't recall the numbers offhand, but between all the existing trees in the back, um, you know, by the warehouse, and then everything that we're doing with that 25-foot <coughs> landscape buffer against that resident, I mean, that alone is more than required and then you add everything else so in that one requirement we're way in excess um in other words if you <coughs> eliminate the areas near the warehouse and it's their parking lot it really pr might meet the requirements or be no, pretty no, no it, it it doesn't it doesn't george that's why i was that's a comment that i was talking about before if you took out the area of the the movement of the trucks you still only I get to I would still be short. I, I By the half. gap would be narrower, yeah. but I would still be short. We we did have that calculation. We probably still have it in the computer. Um, I don't recall it offhand. Yeah. And just to make an additional comment, right now there's no landscaping, <coughs> and um, the 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 plan that Kevin has, where we had twenty. 21 planted islands where there are none. We're one short, and we acknowledge that. We need a waiver for that. But um, in terms of improving the existing non-conforming condition, we're, we're, we think we're making a huge advance towards... With the 4,000 additional, 4,800, whatever. The, you're not going to yeah. notice that missing footage compared to, to what it is now, to what it will be when it's planted. Well, I think some of the trees that you're proposing to put in the islands are a little more significant than we've seen other places too. I mean, they're well. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I'm calling trees. for three and a half inch caliper trees, yeah. six to eight foot conifers. Yeah, you um, have different levels, right? Plants, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, if the idea I, I is to kind of shade parts of the parking lot and create it, the appearance of green, it, it's better than a lot of other people have proposed. Right. 
I mean, again, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat again, one of my goals specifying the six to eight was to try and give the neighbors more buffering initially than wait <coughs> another three to four years for a five to six foot to get to six to eight. Governor? Most of the questions were asked already, but uh, the mechanicals on top of the building, will they be on top and will they be exposed to anything or will they be covered? Well, or the mechanicals? Probably air conditioning floor. units would go there. I mean, yeah. again, we, we showed a generator and transformer in that island behind. Um, I, again, I, I don't know all the mechanical equipment that might go up there, but it would be behind the fourth foot parapet. Behind the four foot parapet. Okay. Would it make any difference in terms of noise if it was put over to the Maple Street side as opposed to further down Middletown Avenue? Yeah, yeah so you... Yeah, but some of them make more noise yeah. than others. The, the, I think the kitchen's in the back, so yeah. the pool would be in the back. Okay. And that's one long gallery. And by the back, you mean toward west, Maple the Street? West, the, the west, west side. side. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. All the service uh, area. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I put it up. <laughs> it's I'm always moving my head. Um, questions on this end? I guess just one more just comment doesn't necessarily need a response, but the um, the fencing, well, I guess I do have a question. The fencing that's around the patio and the outside architecturally, is that what's shown in that picture? Is that sort of the preferred the black fencing? Iron yeah, the black, fence, like, correct. totally see-through. So right, but I it has to be a you know, certain space. height to protect the, the wall by, by code, but yeah, it would be an architectural but in terms of, we can talk about shielding with trees, or we could talk about shielding with like maybe something that's a little bit less see-through and allows the noise to go through. Just uh, you don't get the view of like the open space, so you're you're losing a little bit. But maybe like for somebody who's pretty close to that patio, sure, conversation is quiet, but every now and then it may not be but if you felt that an opaque fence was i'm, ju I'm just saying like to, right. if that turns in if it turns into a conversation that maybe that's something to consider as opposed to the, the as aesthetic opposed to more plantings i think the aesthetic is, is less attractive because it also prevents you from seeing the building yeah, but sure that's and i'm and honestly i'm still struggling with the height of that situation the height so of the <coughs> sorry making it more solid even higher, okay. <laughs> in my opinion. If you right. made that recommendation, we would have to go back to the historic, the historic district commission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I said, it was just a comment. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? So, um, I I do want to offer the opportunity for any last thoughts from the public. You, you, you did hear some answers. Um, if I may do this from my seat, the gentleman from 321 Middletown Avenue is quite correct. The street was closed by MDC and their famous clean water project right at Middletown Avenue yeah. and Mill Street. Yeah. And it was closed for significant amounts of time. And it did, as someone who used to walk more than I do now, it did impact the traffic and who drives I, I would agree, and that was, I, I, I hope you recognized um, our questioning of the traffic engineer, and the answer that we got was that they went back to earlier Borden studies and used another number that should have predated that work, because you're absolutely right, that sh that would have affected those numbers. So, yes, ma'am. And if you, if you could help, and we really do need to record you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Teresa Tomasi, 174 Middletown Avenue. Um, I just want to say something about the patio. In as much as there's only four or five tables there, um, that doesn't mean that it's just a quiet um, evening. A lot of people will gather there for events, class reunions, whatever, and you'll get a crowd out there standing and drinking, and it can get loud whether there's music or not. So 
and uh, you know, just keep that in mind. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if there's no additional uh, questions for the applicant, um, are we prepared to close the hearing? Ready for a vote. Second. All, right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. All right. Conversation or uh, proposed motion? Well, let me let me ask this um, in terms of the town staff comments questions all that kind of stuff where are you in terms of the review of the document so you're I should have asked this before we yep, close the hearing that's fine uh, there there have been some um, I would call them minor tweaks to the plan as Kevin um, presented um, he made some changes to the area around the uh, buffer uh, he made some changes uh, for the uh, utilities and, and such um, However, we do have a December 16th um, response memo from Close Jensen and Miller um, that goes through the various uh, comments. Um, as I said earlier, uh, this was reviewed uh, during a time when our engineer uh, was out of the office and he relied on the Rocky Hill staff. They may or may not have a slightly different professional opinion on some of the responses. So what I would probably uh, uh, similar to the last application, I would probably suggest, um, obviously, the motion include the waivers that were discussed, assuming um, you don't have any significant problem with those, but also um, the standard condition that um, the um, revised plans before they're signed uh, by the chairman uh, are uh, reviewed one more time <coughs> to the satisfaction of the uh, fire marshal, uh, the planning department, um, the engineering department and whether he coordinates with Rocky Hill, I'll leave that up to him. Uh, we did also get some comments from the health district. Uh, since it is a restaurant, they will have to be uh, involved as well. So I would just uh, ask that uh, those staff level reviews um, uh, are done um, before the final uh, plan uh, is, um, is uh, signed off on. And then obviously there were some other issues here um, that were discussed by the neighbors that um, you would want to obviously attach um, on top of that depending upon your level uh, of concern about some of those issues. I think there may be a difference of opinion on some of them, um, some of them more li more uh, significant than others. So um, that's what I would, uh, I would suggest. So, you know, the, the, the comments from the public that, uh, in my mind, um, might want to be considered uh, would be uh, basically whether, whether we want to contemplate asking the applicant to do something about right turns, right? Um, by the way, there was a comment about the traffic study going to the police department. I don't know if it matters, honestly, um, but does that happen anyways? Um, it, it has not historically happened. Uh, we rely on the um, town engineer's review of the traffic um, uh, reports. At least that's been uh, my experience. Uh, um, uh, but I, th I think that might be a, a conversation uh, we have going forward, going forward in terms of an internal review process. But um, yeah. but it has not um, traditionally uh, been something we rely on the uh, town engineer to do that. And, and, and for the individual who made the comment, the reason I, I characterize it in that manner that it might not matter is because the police department has their own records uh, of the accident activity. Um, unless, unless there's a discrepancy between people's records, whether it's DOT or the, uh, the, or the town, um, the characterization of the, of the accidents doesn't really change. So um, it would be professional opinion discussions more than anything else. If, if you gave it to the police department. Um, what else? Uh, oh, by the way, there's a question on parking for employees. Uh, absolutely, I'll answer for the traffic engineer that, that parking generation numbers include the employees. Um, so, so in terms of uh, controlling the activities on the patio, I, I don't. I, I think it's probably reasonable if we go down this path to to suggest achieving something that uh, we 
put some constraints on the patio in terms of you know just even if we characterize it as a noise conditions and and uh, you know no music after such and such a time. <coughs> there's there's a part of me that's there's a part of me that's thinking that the noise on the patio and, and up until some point where the traffic starts backing down. The traffic is the primary noise. That's mm -hmm. just my guess. I don't live there, but that's a guess. There's a lot of traffic going through there, and I can imagine it's not quiet enough to hear the person 300 feet away until 9 o'clock at night. That would be a guess, right? Um, whether that's true or not, I don't really know, but I kind of think that's, that's, that's not if there's a party going on out there, right? The bar is right next to the glass window. Do people mull out there after the dinner? tower is over um, I wouldn't be surprised I don't know if that's something that that we should consider discussing and restricting um, you know I'm just throwing out thoughts are you thinking hours of operation uh, hours outside of op until 1130 type thing 11 o'clock or and, and maybe just some character the noise ordinance itself is pretty solid right. and and maybe that's all that need be right or you uh, I'm just kind of Well, I think Rich actually pointed out it's the noise at the it's it's actually the noise at the property line, right? So that in itself, maybe that's all yeah. you know. Right. Yeah. I mean, the property line is yeah, well, really well, it's, it's, around it's, at, it's at the bottom of the yeah. wall. Right. I th I thought where you were headed in in your comment was to just make clear that the patio is for the use of people seated at the table, so that you don't have fifty oh. standing room only, but it's a dining. <laughs> Or whatever function seated. Yeah, it's noise so yeah. it's yeah. right. Not an event and then their parking is calculated on 24 seats on the patio. Right. Okay. Yeah. It totally is a sit-down restaurant, anyway. So hmm? it's a sit-down restaurant. So it is. I, I've never been there, so I don't know how it operates. <laughs> right. Um, I'm just making sure. I, I don't think the. I think as like to your point, like as the traffic dies at one, the traffic is going on at like five six o'clock at night people are going to be talking louder because the traffic's going to be really loud you're still not going to be able to hear them but like later at night that's when it becomes like the actual issue like the stragglers at nine um but you know by and large they're not necessarily talking over traffic so hopefully they're not yelling but if it becomes an issue with like w we could deal with it like through any other through the noise ordinances yes. right through a complaint process yeah i mean and, and if at the other location we were talking about the noise from 91 being the you know the background noise level that violates the noise ordinance i mean here it's this a is clear shot to 91 as well i think the one in front of the well i think it's a little further but there's no wall yeah the height of the height of it is yeah right. peter the procedural items that you had for staff observation do, do you suggest all those be absorbed within the motion I think there were only a, th a few within those memos that needed further clarification, but I would just say uh, generally that uh, all of those final comments are satisfied to the, I just can't say that our town engineer who was away uh, agrees with the engineer from but Rocky that's Hill. something internally because that can yes. be done beyond the motion itself. Well, I think it should be in the motion so that that gets, you know, it's clear to everybody that it gets checked off during the process going forward. Mr. Chairman, would you like a motion to, so we can go through this and add the pieces out just so, so we can try this? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw one more comment out before we do try that, right? Um, and that is, what, are this, what does the committee feel about uh, the, the landscaping? Um, so the waivers, but also what's been proposed. Um, is there a feeling that it needs to be enhanced um, as, as might have been offered around? You know, more of them 10 feet on center, that kind of stuff. You know, I, I'm just trying to get a feel. I want people to think about it. I guess. I mean, I, I, my concern would be the buffering toward the south, you know, more than more than almost anything else. Right. Um, you know, because that's where the greatest impacts are going to be. Um, it might you know, based on the prior hearing with the with the light issue. I guess that's been taken care of. And, you know, if you get mature trees that, that are out on the front, you know, that that's not as big a deal, but it, it was the the visual and the noise and the, you know, just kind of general impact and light and everything buffering toward in the southerly direction was what I 
I think you know, we need to make sure it's as robust as possible. So ba you're basically saying the, yeah. the, the southern boundary, basically, yeah. from where the new landscaping starts all the way to the street. Right. And maybe coming up a, a, a little bit around. A little bit around. Yeah. The said the we're talking problem. about around the detention the pond, top. folks. Well, I think up above it, not below it. Around it? The southern side and the east side? No, I, I was thinking the west side, actually. I got the wrong direction. Yeah, because oh, you're you're on you're on the uphill side, side right? Yeah. So yeah, the west side of it. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I support that, and they did offer, you know, to to work on that. So, so may, maybe you want to add a condition that um, uh, staff uh, have the discretion um, at the time of planting that to ensure that. Uh, an adequate um, separation distance between some of the buffer species are um, installed so that um, the intent of the buffer uh, landscaping requirement is uh, satisfied. Yeah. And it, it, you know, it's one thing to see it on the plan, but when you get out there in the field, there may be some adjustment necessary because there's a particular view through to the neighbor's house or across the street, and sometimes those field adjustments can, can make a big difference. Yeah, I mean, or, or like a through lane in within the parking lot might be in the gap in the trees right. and so forth. Yep. Um, yeah. to, go, to go back to the, the patio, and I'll just throw this out for consideration, whether we reserve the right to review operational issues after basically one summer season so that if it turns out, um, you know, that, that there's a lot of complaints and a lot of noise and so forth, you know, that we can, you know, kind of revisit the issue. If it turns out to be a non-event, then so be it. But I, I do want to at least preserve the right for us to say, you know, this isn't working out. I, li I like that. Is there a similar, like, line that we can add for the landscaping itself where, like, if a certain percentage dies off, then it's not replaced over a certain amount of time. Like, to make sure that what we approve is what's out there year after year. So we have a one-year, um, you know, requirement in the landscaping regulations, and then um, this landscaping plan becomes the. It, it's no different than a handicap parking space has to be there versus another thing has to be there on the site plan. So we so maintain. You have to maintain compliance with this landscaping plan correct okay going, yep. going forward going forward yeah so peter we have gone back was it dutch plant we went back and they had replaced trees that died out many years ago that's okay. correct yep so you want to go through the waivers and, and make sure everybody's comfortable with what they're seeing so it's the uh landscape screening for the loading area there's no screening of the loading area for the existing warehouse Right, that's that's up against the building. They don't; it doesn't exist today. Um, but quite frankly, I, I personally think this the screening on the whole site's going to make that better than it exists today. Uh, the landscape island islands, I think we beat it on that pretty well. Um, we never, you know, I, we we hardly ever managed to make that threshold. 100%. You know. Um, I'd like it to be bigger, but I think if you take out the movements of the truck area, it's certainly a lot of, a better number. It still wouldn't make it, but so personally, I'm kind of comfortable with that one, right? I'm comfortable with that. And um, and and again, you heard me say before that I th I I think there's a balance in that you know we have a lot more peripheral landscaping that's proposed than would otherwise be required. I think when you look at it from a historical standpoint where it's historically been there to what this plan I just kind of count them up there was like over 400 plantings on that list yeah and I didn't get into the, uh, the last session yeah. so, all right. so, the, so all three are the landscape three of the four are landscape I islands so um, let's talk about this enough on the landscaping setbacks everybody okay with the four so far um, the setback at 26 feet uh, when 50 is the requirement for business for a BP zone. Um, 
can't say I'm loving it. It's still very close to the front. It's tall and not very set back. I like their their opinion of mm -hmm. the streetscape life. And it's a little, it's a newer age look. Yeah. You look at some things like that. And it has a, just the whole concept of it. And that is, it's, it's like they stuff it back in the corner. And it really doesn't matter what the building looks like. Mm -hmm. I, th I think the one important thing to mention is this is the only zone, um, commercial zone in town that has a 50 foot front yard. All of the others are 25. So the, the design uh, team took their cue from our standard 25 foot front yard setback and tried to uh, mimic that. So this is the only zone, um, believe it or not, in the entire town, commercial zone, that has a 50 foot setback. So also the, the architecture of the proposed restaurant seems much designed much more to fit into a more well settled residential area as opposed to the the commercial institutional box box that that's <laughs> sort of behind it and, and i think it makes you know it, it makes a much more attractive statement for uh, the entire site than uh, does exist right now yeah i mean and, and i guess you know, having kind of looked at the overall aerial view, I mean, you know, if it's the welcome to Weathersfield corner, you know, yeah, having an imposing restaurant does send a message, but two of the other corners are, you know, parking lots and drainage ditches, um, and the other one is the meadows. So um, I'd, I'd rather not have a third corner of parking lot as sort of the, the gateway. I, I agree, and I guess also that this is getting it as far as it's possible to get it away from the neighbors, which I think is also another good thing as opposed to moving it back towards the neighbors. But I I like, I mean, we've had other applications over the many years on the Silestein Highway, and I I think there's a lot of value to having the buildings close up to the street just in terms of the aesthetics, you know, and I think they're, <coughs> they've done a nice job on that. That would also come into play on the overall appraisal, the value, the taxes itself. We had a blighted property here three to five years ago, which had a potential of having an incredible amount of truck volume 24 seven, maybe paying 12 to $15,000 a year in taxes. And with this landscaping and the presentation today, we could yield close to seventy five to eighty thousand dollars a year in property taxes. I think having the building up front is a positive for appraisal purposes and for assessment purposes. So you whack them real hard on the front. <laughs> <laughs> he does appraisals for other towns and we can all be happy for that. <laughs> uh, uh, to th the last waiver that's been requested, um, mo uh, modification from 6-2, allow for parking and loading space between the building and the street line, right? So that's an existing that's the condition, existing one, yeah, right? Right. Okay. <coughs> okay. What else should we be discussing? I think at a minimum, as far as right turns on Middletown Avenue, we should reinforce to the extent that we can the existing no commercial regulation or restriction on the no commercial, the commercial right trail. So, so it's a town road. Yeah, you can't do it on a state road. How do you do it on a local road? Well, you put up a sign and pray. So, so is there a is there a um, no the process no that we went through? Yeah, is there a no through trucks that the town has put no in place? We already have that on the right street. Right yes. This would be. Yeah, they already have it for, <coughs> okay. for the street. This would be, you know, because they're not really going through, they are servicing a facility on Middletown Avenue. We just don't want the trucks turning right to <coughs> continue going. And I don't think that we want to prevent a truck from going down Middletown. Well, I thought the town no, already had put up a sign point. saying no through trucks. Yeah. I, 
I say put them on state roads as early as possible and keep them there. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're supposed to do. Can't, can't do them on state roads. All right. Um, <laughs> so we've talked about exceptions. We've talked about no right turns. We've talked about staff, um, staff comments or staff um, follow-up for comments. We gotta breathe that gut. On, on the landscaping and the follow-up with staff, do we wanna make the affirmative statement that we would like to see some enhancements in the landscaping to be worked out with staff so at least we go on record that we think it has to be enhanced to some level? So I wanna be more specific in terms of the area for purposes of. He, he said you can go from 15 to 10. Right. Percent. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned though with regard to uh, the, the narrowing of the distance between the plantings also means you may increase the likelihood for a die off. So, so Peter um, phrased it I yeah, thought, pretty I, well before. Just yeah, I, I would prefer that it be a field specific uh, consultation with the landscape architect for the project and, and town staff, um, you know, prior to them being installed. Yeah, the, you know, it, it's important about what species get selected, what their size are, all that kind of stuff. So, and we can do that in the field. And, and do you care if it's specific to the area we were t talking about, South End, or is it just the whole site? Yeah, I think it's the whole site. Okay. I mean, there were other, there were other, um, important components of the landscaping plan, not just on the on the south side that I, I feel warrant a further look at the look. Okay. So I got four basic topics, I, I think. What else? You wanna just try and create something and see if anything else comes up? Peter, was there anything else on the close Johnson Miller? Mm. Or you just want to? I think, as I said, we have that condition. Have that condition. That we'll, we'll go through all of those and make sure each uh, separate department uh, is, is happy with that. Yep. Okay. So I, I I just remember the fifth one that <coughs> uh, had Richard and entertain uh, reserving the right to uh, revisit the operations on the patio. On the patio yep. Anybody want to try and make a motion? So um, first thing would be the, um, I guess it's in essence six waivers uh, would be included. Uh, four of them are landscaping related. One is the building setback in the front yard and the, the other is the uh, loading uh, related to the loading uh, uh, in, the in the front yard. Um, the second grouping of uh, conditions relate to staff, um, final staff comments before the final revised plan is submitted for the chairman's signature. And then the other uh, cluster of conditions uh, regarding the uh, no trucks turning right uh, onto Middletown Avenue, um, the landscape buffer field uh, adjustments and enhancements. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry, not the landscape buffer, but the landscape plan uh, enhancements and staff field adjustments. Uh, the activities on the patio, uh, first of all, complying with the noise ordinance. Um, and then uh, more importantly, uh, the activities on the patio being reviewed uh, operationally within uh, a year of the summer season being completed, the first su summer season being completed. Um, I think those were the. That's, that's mine. That's, that's what mine I have. Yep. Yep. Sorry. I was going to say, somebody make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve application number 2028 19 3. Second. Following conditions that Peter just outlined, just sort of cleaned up and just was clear enough in our statement. George, you're going to second it? No, no, second on that. No. Sorry. Further discussion? Just on the just the comment on the on the use and and that aspect of things and the and the traffic. I mean, I think it's a busy road and it is what it is. Um, but I think part part of my part of my thought right now is taking a look at the business park 
regulations, there's other things that they could do where they wouldn't even need a special use permit from us. One example would be a medical office building. Um, and it seems to me a medical office building, you know, depending on the size, has the potential to be a heavier impact on traffic because it's going to be all day in the morning. Um, and that's allowed, you know, in the business park zone as one example. So I'm, I'm, uh, and the and the other thing is, I mean, I think as the traffic engineer said, you're, you might have 69 movements coming in, but you're spreading it in different directions. Some are going to Middletown, some are going to the Silas Dean, some are in, not out, and vice versa. So it, it breaks it down further. Um, so what do you want? No, so I'm saying I'm comfortable with it based on that compared to what another use might be that it's spread out yeah. and given that to something what else. We may have to, a couple of new buildings down the way. Correct, and I think given given the fact that I think the design is very high quality and looks good as as well on compared to what the site is now. So. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Make a motion to approve the December 3rd minutes. So moved. Any, any edits? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? S staff reports. Peter, you got anything to tell us about our upcoming? Uh, no, so you do. Um, we do have three agenda items for the uh, next meeting, so uh, please look at your calendar and make yourselves um, uh, available for that. So it uh, will be another uh, busy night. Um, Is it the Wednesday? It's the Wednesday, rather because of the Martin Luther King Monday, so uh, which is different from most people's schedules. But nevertheless, if you anticipate or you know s as soon as you can, let me know in case that night it, it is going to be problematic because there's a couple big projects on that agenda. So it's a wen the Wednesday, the twenty second. It's, wen it's a Wednesday meeting. Great. Okay. A dog, a home occupation dog care. Yes. <laughs> Timing is everything. <laughs> I know, huh? I'm, I'm not going to be participating in that one. Um, did they build a Did they build a wall at the other doggy daycare? I, I'm sorry, what was that? Did they build the fence yet at the no, other? No, um, they have to construct the detention basin, and because it's in the back first before they can put the wall up. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg. Uh, knock, knock on wood. Uh, they've been lucky so far with the weather. So. Um, Hopefully they will be able to complete it before things uh, freeze up. But um, they were working with the engineering department uh, last week about some of the details of the basin to make sure they uh, got it right. So they, they have the contractor and uh, they are, um, they may have, I haven't been by in the last few days, they may, may already be under construction. By the way, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, kind of thank the Historic District Commission and that can be passed on to the staff for the work they did on this particular pro project because I've been disappointed recently that they were substituting for our design review people because it was the Historic District and they didn't make positive contributions. They not only made positive contributions but they convinced the applicant to go along with and uh, so I, I thought it worked out very well tonight. I will let them know. I'll pass it on. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. 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 <laughs> Where did this, this outfit didn't turn up? One second. Okay. Oh, right here. Yeah. 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 Yeah.